Morning, everybody. Morning, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give everybody a, a minute. I think most of us are here. <laughs> Morning, John. Okay. Let me get set up. Okay. Um, and John, is my audio clear? Yeah, it's clear. Great. Okay. Um, let's get started. I'm going How are you to. Doing? Good. <laughs> I'm going to um, share my screen. <clears throat> and uh, there are two things that. Oh. If you're, um, if you can mute your microphone. That's great. Um, there are a couple of things that we have to get done today. Um, we are going to walk through uh, a data science notebook. Uh, and there's a couple of applied problems that will post to the class so you can see, uh, you know, how data science is going to go. Okay. Um, for, those of you, for those of you who are aspiring data scientists. And uh, before we get started, um, uh, to break the ice, I was wondering if we could just go around the room very quickly, um, and we'll have to go, you know, pretty quickly because I think there's about, let's see, five into five twenty-five. So I think there's fifty of us here, and um, so if you just say your name, I'll call out. I, I don't know if you have the grid the same way I have it, uh, but if you um, can tell us your name and um, what your background is, and uh, maybe something interesting. Maybe, you know, what you would like to see in the course, uh, up to you, right? Uh, I think that would help because I'm, I'm sure we have a very diverse uh, group uh, uh, of background here. So, you already know me. I I'm Frank Sagar. I'm here to help. Um, so, let's go to um, Stacy. Stacy Gerald, I think Stacy's here to help us run Slack and whatnot. So, Muted, yes, can good see. morning, everyone. Thank you for joining day two of module one. I am the uh, program manager for the RCMI program, the one who's sponsoring this. We are research centers and minority institutions. Thank you everyone for joining uh, and enjoy the presentation. Great, thank you, Stacey. Uh, Irby Hunter. Everybody, I think you're muted. Yeah. There you go. You, uh, you unmuted and then muted again. <laughs> I can hear you. It's a little bit jumbled, but I can hear it. Yeah. I thought you wanted me muted. One more time, Irby. I'm sorry. I thought you wanted me to be on mute. No, 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 no. You can uh, unmute and uh, uh, tell us your name, your, your, a little bit about your background. Oh, okay. My name is uh, Dr. Rihanna. I am a professor here at the Community College of Baltimore County. My discipline is health informatics. I have a background in medicine. I'm a physician and have been studying data science and data analytics for the last four or five years. And just excited for the opportunity to learn more and uh, teach this to my students, students and apply it to uh, research projects. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, Ella Thornton. Hi, everyone. My name is Ella Thornton. I received my BA from Jackson State University, my MA from in economics. 
my MA from Power University in economics, and I'm just excited and eager to learn some fundamentals in Python. Great, we'll definitely get into that, yeah. Uh, I'm going to make a mistake in the pronunciation, but I'm going to try my best. So, Gaisnov Lutumba? Yes, Gaisnov Lutumba. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm Gaznov Mutumba from uh, Kentucky. I am actually a student in data science at Northern Kentucky University. Mm. Great, yeah. Thank you very much, Um uh, So it just shows up as quasi. Yeah. I just want to say something quick. Emmanuel, can you please mute your microphone? Yeah, my name is Kwesin Yibwafini, and I also work for uh, our university of CMI, and I'm one of the teams. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Uh, Richard um, Boateng? Yeah, uh, so I'm Richard Boateng. I'm currently a PhD student at the Dublin City University in Ireland. Uh, doing PhD in accounting. Great. Uh, everybody, just give me one second. I'll be right back. Uh, as we wait for uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Saga, I'm John Quijan. I'm the director of this uh, training uh, program. And then for those of you uh, who are here yesterday, thank you for making it today too. If today is your first time, also welcome uh, to 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 this program. Okay, so uh, he is here, so I'll hand over to him. Okay, so what did I miss? I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I introduced myself in your absence, Prem. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, that's great. Um, and so the board has moved a bit, but let's go to uh, Emmanuel Akala. My name is Emmanuel Akala. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in the College of Pharmacy. Uh, my area of research is uh, dosage form design and drug delivery. Pharmaceutical dosage form design and drug delivery. I'm very much interested in multi and megavirid data analysis. In the literature, we come across the use of PCA, PLS, and so on and so forth. And I want to be able to understand the literature and apply the concept to my research. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, through uh, Sadatman, I think it is a, there's a, do the low bandwidth. Okay, so you may have low bandwidth, bro. We'll wait for a second. Okay, Fro, if you get unmuted, you can just interrupt us. Uh, Nana Asafo. Nana is what makes this go, okay? <laughs> no, 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 that's that's the that's the truth. Uh my name is Nana Osafu. Um I'm the IT director for the uh, RCMI program. And I, I had my undergrad at uh Ken UST in Kumasi, Ghana, and did my master's in uh at Howard University. And I, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Nana. Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh Sheila Alisi. Hello, I'm an associate professor at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Um, my background is biopsychology. I've been doing Python in the context of data science uh, for about a year or so now, and I mostly do NIH funded clinical trials in the area of addictions. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, 
Can you talk more about the uh, like field of addiction? Is it opium? Like, where are you? Yeah. And so um, I I don't I don't um, discriminate between <laughs> between addictions, but I uh, lately have been focusing mostly on alcohol use disorder and opiate use disorder. Wow. Yeah. So are you familiar with Arco? Are you I guess you, you've heard of this and whatnot or no? I am not, but I jotted it down when you mentioned it yesterday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Zulo Thomas Adan Yanju. Adela, you may be muted. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Alfred Guyan. Yeah, um, my name is Alfred Jan. Um, from Arizona. Uh, I work with Intel as a solution architect. Uh, I want to dive into data science. So I'm just here to explore and also see uh, how best I can change my career. Um, yeah, so I'm here to explore. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, very quickly on that note, they had a uh, uh, Google with a big sponsor of uh, Python and a, a lot of libraries, particularly TensorFlow. And uh, they had a, um, uh, a video where they asked two of their top engineers, you know, how do you break into the field of data science? And they unanimous, I have a different opinion on this, but it's, it's uh, since I understand their opinion, um, their answer was learn Python. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, the good news is that Python is actually quite easy to learn, right? And Jupyter, mm -hmm. which you'll see today, uh, makes it, it, it's its almost like, it's too easy, it's amazing. So, um, okay. great, thank you so much, Alfred. Uh, this right. one is just, uh, I think, um, an act, oh, I don't know, yeah, uh, Asamoa, Asamoa. Sounds like someone's screen name, maybe. ASA MOA. H. Okay, we'll come back for that. Uh, Ashley Bampo. Ashley, you may be muted. Hi, this, uh, I don't know if um, I was called, but my, my name is Ashley Bampo. Um, I'm a uh, I just graduated from Howard University in December of 2020. Um, shout out to Dr. Quajan because he was one of my uh, professors. So thank you. You're you're a psychic, Ashley, because you were called on. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, uh, Bernard Quabi, and your last name is uh, Trump. But let's say Bernard Quabi. So, hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Bernard Quaviado. My background is biochemistry, molecular biology, and a cancer biologist at Howard University. And uh, I'm really here to learn as much as I can on this big data. Uh, from my question yesterday, I'm really interested in how to really mine genomics. So hmm. please feed us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. Yeah. Um, Betsy Baron Backbold. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Betsy Van uh, I work, I, I live in uh, Arlington, Virginia. I uh, am a BI dev analyst for Transurban, uh, which is a tolling company. And I, I do a lot of like database management and bit work with, uh, as you said, big data. Um, so yeah, I'm just interested to learn and uh, kind of pick things up and kind of do some refreshers too. Fantastic. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, Benjamin Ogandelli. Benjamin, you may be muted. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back for Benjamin. Hello. Uh, yes. Oh, no, go ahead, Benjamin. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I just joined the class right now. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit about yourself? Yeah. 
Okay, um, my name is Benjamin Ogundele. I am from New Jersey. Um, I have a master's in public health. I concentrated in epidemiology. Um, going forward, I'm interested in data, um, data work, um, working with data and doing research. Um, so I'm joining this class to, you know, enhance my skill and knowledge on data science. Fantastic. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, where in New Jersey are you? Um, Union, New Jersey. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up in the um, Princeton Junction area, and I've been all over New Jersey. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Aya? Can we already do Aya? The board is moving on me. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Aya. I'm a graduate student uh, at Morgan State and this year is my third year in the bioenvironmental science program and I'm working in a project related to microbiome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, uh, Visa. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Beza. Okay, mm -hmm. hello everyone. My name is Beza and I'm a graduate student at Howard and I'm here to explore more on data science. Thanks, Beza. Yeah. Okay, so we're on the C's, making progress. Okay, uh, Charles Kofi Som. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Charles. Oh, very good. Uh, good, good afternoon from here. I'm Charles Kofison from Ghana. Um, I have a background in geomatic engineering, <clears throat> but I'm currently, <clears throat> sorry, currently I'm practicing as a statistician. So um, learning data science, I think uh, I'm here to explore and see how best I can integrate data science in my statistical work and as well as practicing my engineering because I hope to get my surveying license by the end of the year. So basically to explore and to learn new things around it. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so grateful. Actually, it was my it is yeah, it's my friend uh, Edmond, Edmond Ameyao, and who introduced uh, me to this program. And I'm so grateful. Edmond is fantastic. I I um he was a student of ours at College Park, an extraordinarily hard worker. Kept me in lecture till around eleven thirty every night. Um oh, and, and I, see, I, see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we were in the same secondary school, the same university. We worked in statistical service for some years before he left. So I know him so okay. much well, pretty well. Yeah. He's yeah, a hard working guy. guy. Very hard working yeah. guy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Claudia Greco. Hi. Um, I'm Claudia. I'm a vision student of biological sciences, and uh, I know nothing about Python or programming in general, so I'm just trying to keep up. That's perfect. That means you have no biases, right? Uh, and uh, what you'll see today is largely, you know, there'll be some parts that are technical, but Python is designed to flow like English. Um, and Jupiter, I, I'm very excited to show you this. Jupiter makes it like you're writing to somebody. So, um, so welcome. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I lost that place. So we did, um, I don't think we did Clinton Burnside. Hello, I'm think? Clint. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So Clinton Burnside, I'm, uh, an MPH, uh, student at Howard university. Um, I know Ashley well and Dr. Quajon, as well as Dr. Kwabi Ado. So um, I, I don't know anything about Python, but I really want to um, here to learn more about it and see if I if I'm able to use it in my studies. Fantastic, thank you. Um, D. Um, hello, hi. My name is Dorcas. I am a Ghanaian. I work in the telecommunications industry. I am basically here to learn more about to learn about Python. I have never used it, but previously I used to work in um, a quality assurance department in my company. So hopefully, as my career grows, I'll be able to use that in my journey. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I have the deepest respect for quality assurance. Um, 
data science does not work without quality assurance. Um, you'll see that, like, no model comes out without running verification on test data. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I, you heard me say it, you know, dealing with big data, understanding the requirements, uh, and then quality assuring it, particularly quality assuring the data are the missing pieces um, that plague us right now in the field of data science. So, uh, great. Thank you so much for sharing, Dee. Uh, okay, so uh, Daniel Atakora. Hello. From Ghana, um, I did economics in the university. I specialized in health economics and international and monetary finance. And this is my very first time, and I want to learn about Python and use it um, in my career. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so uh, forgive me if I've already called on you, uh, Duccio Paglei. I don't think we called on uh, Duccio. Hello everyone, I'm Duccio, I'm 20, and I'm from Italy. Uh, I'm interested in this subject. I'm interested to, to learn English, to, to learn uh, Python language, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and let's see, um, Edward Amankra. I'm Edward Amankra. I'm, I'm joining you from the UK. I'm in Oxfordshire. Um, background is controlling computer engineering, work in financial services, um, asset developer, stroke business analyst. Um, I've played with Python a little bit, not in great detail, um, but this course is just to try and, I guess, get me well versed in it and see how I can use it within the financial industry, the space that I work in. Fantastic. Edward, are you in the UK right now? Yes, I am. Where in the UK are you? Oh, Abingdon. It's a small village around Oxford. Okay. So, um, forgive me for asking. Uh, the majority of my research right now is targeted towards COVID. What is the situation like where you are? Are you guys still in lockdown? How, how, how are things? How are you? Yeah. They're okay. I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me to say, actually, because we've oh. been in lockdown forever, right? We've been in lockdown for almost a whole year now. So, um, besides going to the shop, there is very little that we do outside. The news is quite frightening, but um, I think people are just getting on with their lives. Things are getting better. We're pushing out the vaccine quite a bit, and so there is a chance, there is a chance that... But the come, the, come the spring, things should be opening up a little bit here. That's great, Evan. That's, that's great. Um, okay, Prem, before yeah. you continue, I think you called I'm Asamoah and you. he crazy. didn't yeah. respond, but he sent a chat that his, his mic, he doesn't have a mic, so he can only hear, so he can't talk, but he said he's a director of, he's the director of a small animal imaging center, Georgia Cancer Center, Augusta University, and he's interested in applying data science in image processing. And again, he says his mic he doesn't have a mic to speak. No problem. Thank you so much, John. And that was for Emmanuel. Oh, that was Ilaria Francesca. Okay, great. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, if you're not um, uh, speaking, if you could mute, because there's some noise coming through. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, Flavia Sognum Migilio? <laughs> yes, do, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, Flavia. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am from Italy, and I just graduated in molecular biology on November 2020. And I'm here just to learn something about data science. I'm very glad to be here. Fantastic. Uh, Flavia, I have to ask as well, um, how is the situation uh, with COVID? How, how are things in Italy? Uh, well, we are divided into some different areas. We have some areas with uh, um, very so much um, people with the COVID. So some areas are more um, open, so uh, the, the markets are open, also the restaurants, but uh, there are 
other areas um, where we can uh, we can just uh, go out uh, uh, from our home. Great, yeah. Great, yeah. Do you feel like things are getting better? Yeah, we Good. hope so. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Flavia. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Um, yeah. Uh, Fushin, um, Andrews, almost there. Hi, it's it's Hi. even here in Ghana. Good evening, um, Fushin Andrews, and um, IT operations um, officer. The place that I work now, which is Microsoft, actually. Um, development partner in Ghana here. And then uh, I have had the opportunity to be introduced to an application called the DHIS2 by the University of Oslo uh, on the data uh, analysis. And so once I received this uh, opportunity, I saw it to be a very welcome because I've been working on this and I'm very, very much eager to learn data science. So I pick up the opportunity to actually come in here and learn more about data science and its um, possibilities. Thank you for the opportunity given. Oh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, let's see. Francesco Mastroianni. Mastroianni. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Francisco, can you hear us? Or Francisco? Okay, we'll come back. Um, Jeff with a G, G E F F. I guess it's Jeff. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back for uh, Jeff. Um, um, this is an email. So, Govinda dot uh, at gmail dot com. I, uh, I'm uh, Govinda De Carli. I'm a student uh, graduate in uh, uh, neuroscience, master's degree in uh, University of uh, Trieste in Italy. And uh, I have uh, previous uh, uh, knowledge about uh, basics of Python, but uh, not uh, so advanced. So I, I took, uh, I, I take uh, this uh, lecture in, uh, in order to deep understanding about uh, how uh, Python work with uh, data science. Fantastic. Fantastic. A lot of neuroscientists uh, are, are graduating. And um, so have you looked at Neuralink? Are you familiar with what they do? Uh, I don't understand the, the question. Oh, so there's a company called Neuralink. Have you heard of them? No, I, I didn't. I'll leave something in the description. So that is... Uh, a company where they're um, using um, computer implants uh, on animals to monitor what they do and uh, also to help them learn. The latest news is that um, they were able to implant uh, a chip in a monkey's brain and teach the monkey how to play video games from the messages being sent from the neural implant. Um, okay. So it's, uh, it's quite amazing. You know, the hope is that um, their technology can be used to aid things like Alzheimer's and autism. So fascinating, uh, fascinating field. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah. So let's see. Um, Helena Thompson. Helena, you are unmuted, but I can't hear you. Still, uh, still nothing here. Uh, I'm trying, uh, again, yeah. uh, some have indicated that they don't have, don't have mic it. okay. or they are, it's not uh, working. So they've introduced their, them, themselves in the chat room. So if you call them and then they don't respond then. Oh yeah, that's it, fine. It be one, one of them. I don't want to read all of them, but maybe uh, those yeah. who are interested can read yeah, the I chat. Yeah, I see that. Okay, yeah, good, so uh -huh. I'll, I'll pull from that. Okay, so yes. as Elaria, Elaria, okay, yeah, her mic is out, so that doesn't work. Uh, Irby Hunter? Is Irby, yeah. Sir, I introduce myself first. 
I'm already going. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks okay, for no problem. Yeah. The list is moving around. Yeah. Uh, James Tipton, and we're almost on the last row. And I think we are on the last row now. Yeah. James, are you there? Okay, you can interrupt us when we come back. Uh, Kamalic, Muniz, Rodriguez. Hey, uh, my name is Kamalic. I am an epidemiologist. I'm from Puerto Rico, and um, I've been training other data languages, but I have no experience with Python, so I'm in this course just to see if I can learn a little bit more about it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Keisha Smith. You may be muted. You can interrupt us uh, when you get unmuted if you'd like. And finally, Kwame, I think, is that the, oh, we've got a couple. Sorry, more more people have come through. Kwame, uh, F. Oswu Adam. Okay, I'll go quickly here. Um, I think we already did a question. Uh, Luisa Ama Soso. Sosu. Hello, yes, I'm Louisa Amasusu. I am an engineer. I work in the telco sector. I have very little knowledge of Python, and that's one of the reasons why I took the course. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we did that. Uh, let's go to uh, Pearl uh, Ensa. Hi, my name is Pearl, and I'm a major uh, in I'm a major in computer science at NCT here in Texas, and I'm taking this course to just explore career choices. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great, Pearl. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I missed uh, Luca from Magali. Here, I'm a statistician. I work as a researcher in uh, clinical trials, mostly on cancer, and uh, I'm here because I'm curious to know something new about Python. Great. Thank you, Luca. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Piera um, Giglio? <laughs> Stop attempting the last name. So, Piera? <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Hi, okay. So. Piera and I'm from Italy and I am a biologist and actually I know nothing about data science but um, I think it's important to us to know about this, uh, this profession, I mean, so here we are. Fantastic. Thank you, Piera. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I think we already called Richard um, Boteng. We may have already called you. If not, Richard, you can jump in. But I, I think we called you, yeah. Yeah, I've already spoken. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Rocco Giordano? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello, I'm from Italy. I'm 27. I'm graduated in functional genomic at University of Trieste. So I'm, I mean, I, I had experience working in R. Uh, throughout my internship at the University of Oslo, and so I want I I wanna to deep my knowledge in this field. So I'm here. Thank you for <laughs> this opportunity. Oh, thank you for joining us, Rocco. Yeah, uh, Rodley Gallard. Hi, uh, my name is Rodley Gallard. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, currently, I'm doing my master's at Rutgers University on uh, biomedical informatics. So, um, from time to time, I play with data to train, to test uh, machine learning, because that's what basically my study is based on. I have a little bit of a SAS um, MATLAB, but I'm kind of pretty into Python because it's nice and it's the way you train it and you test it and after that you implement it, it's pretty nice. And how you can, from a data, you can analyze the data and come up with some 
idea, some, you know, that's what drive me to this um, training model you guys are doing right now. Fantastic, Rodley. Rodley, have you had to deal with large amounts of data and, and did you struggle when doing so or how did you deal with it? Yes, I kind of struggle usually when using a big, like a large amount of data. Um, I'm pretty good when it comes to like a 500, 200, but as soon as it reach out to a thousand, that's where that's where I have a problem to dice it to see which part of the data I need to use, which part of data I don't need to use, which features it's important versus another one. I have a I'm struggling with that. Yeah, and this is the and I'll talk about it. Um, definitely, we have to talk about Python, but um, when we get into selection of features, I'll address it. Um, so, ec excellent questions and points. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rosanna Cuccinilio? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, Rosanna. Yeah. Yes, I'm Rosanna. I'm from Italy. I'm a PhD student in biology at uh, Federico II University in Naples. And uh, I hope uh, <laughs> I can learn something about data science to use in my research. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, Sarah Rosenpour? Okay. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Sarah. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Sarah Rosenpour. I'm a PhD student at Morgan State University. My major is bioenvir bioenvironmental science, and I just interested in data science. I think it is uh, useful for the future, um, especially for finding jobs. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, and uh, I'm really grateful. Well, we're grateful you're here, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Sure. Uh, Shami Chakrabarti. Hi, um, I'm Shami Chakrabarti. I'm from, um, I'm doing my PhD in City University of New York and in biochemistry. I just want to learn, like, I have no idea about the data science, so I just am here to learn the basics. Thank you for Thank this you. opportunity. Okay, thanks, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, wrong Wu. Okay, we'll come back for you, Rong. Uh, Tiwa Olaj Baju. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Tiwa Olaj Baju. Um, I have a background in electrical engineering, um, and I'm just excited to learn a new programming language and the application of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Tiwa. Uh, uh, Udit Kumar Mahato. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Udit Kumar Mahato, and I am currently in the freshman, re freshman year uh, at, at Northern Kentucky University and I'm currently studying a uh, bachelor in computer science. Awesome, thank you, Edith. Uh, Victor Apri. Well, a, a good morning, a good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Victor Apri and my specialty is systems engineering slash operations research. Yeah. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm retired from family medicine at Howard University. So I'm just here to have fun. <laughs> That's great. The deepest respect for oper operations research, right? So uh, I've had to deal with arena and simulations and um, still very, very valuable. In fact, there are now Python libraries for uh, simulation. So. Oh, okay, great, great. Fantastic. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. Sure. Uh, William Kufi. Hi, I'm William Coffey from Connecticut. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm just here to like um, um, get more knowledge on this world since it's really new to almost everyone. Great, thank you, William. Okay, and finally, Zaki Sharif, if I missed you, we can do it after uh, we go through 
uh, and uh, after the break. But uh, Zaki dot Sharif. Hello, uh, I am from the uh, College of Medicine, Howard University. I'm a faculty member and also a researcher, uh, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I'm a colleague of Dr. Bernard Kwabiado, whose name has been mentioned so many times here. He's one of our favorite professors in the College of Medicine. Uh, and I am interested in uh, getting some knowledge about data science because I have a lot of uh, data from uh, multiple uh, multiple well multi omics data multi i have transcriptomics data i have metabolomics data genomics data and they're driving me crazy i don't want to outsource my data i want to work on them and analyze them myself so yeah. this is a, a good uh, um, you know educational um, platform for me the only thing i know about uh, pythons is, is the genus of constricting snakes that's the only thing i know about python <laughs> Okay, good, yeah. Uh, very good, thank you so much. Um, let's see, there's one more person who's joined, uh, Eugene Lee. And then we'll move into lecture and I'll uh, talk about Python. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Eugene Lee. Yeah, I'm assistant professor of biology at Morgan State University. Um, I'm a, the uh, thesis advisor of Sarah and Aya here. So basically half of my lab is here. Uh, we are biologists and uh, I feel Python is a very convenient and uh, much more powerful tool to analyze and uh, visualize data. Uh, so we want to catch up with uh, data science and also try to incorporate this, employ this new tool in our research. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, so uh, perhaps before you start, I think uh, we are now going to go into the mechanical turn. So I would suggest that maybe the break time is what we've taken for this introduction, which is also a good thing. So if anyone feels that they need a one, two, three minutes uh, bathroom yeah. break, just uh, feel free to, uh, to, to do so. I also want to say that uh, Professor Saga is also the chief data scientist for Crypto Corp, Crypto Corporation, mm -hmm. Crypto as in Bitcoin. <laughs> actually, right? it's uh, actually it's, it's interesting to that um, it's crypto with uh, a C, and it's um, because the organization uh, got its roots in cryptology. All right. Uh, so. Yeah. And I, I understand uh, cryptos are mined. So maybe at yeah. another session, you can come and uh, talk to us about cryptos and data, uh, data science and cryptocurrency. Yeah, Since, they uh, are mined. Yeah, they are Bitcoin mined. is 50,000, we can't buy it. So we have to know how to mine it. So yeah. that is just uh, for another session. <laughs> all right, take to... over, Prem. And then all of you have a, a good session. Yeah, let's do this. So um, let's take a, a five minute break. Thank you. First, thank you everybody for introducing yourselves. I'm, uh, I'm so happy to see that we have people across the world here today uh, of varied backgrounds and um, you're in the right place. We're going to talk about Python. I'm going to show you what it looks like, how we cut up some data, how we build a model, how we can use it to make predictions and get some visualization. So um, that will be the first thing we tackle after we come back from break. If you have questions, feel free. Um, let's come back at 1148. Uh, I'll be back in one minute uh, in case you have questions for me, and then we'll pick up lecture from there. Thanks so much. I'll see you all in a couple of minutes. Yeah.
Okay, I am back. If anybody has questions, I'm going to share my screen now. Hi, Prof. Can can I please ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. I found it a little bit difficult to connect. So by the time I connected, you had actually spent about 30 to 40 minutes um, on what you were doing. Uh, so I couldn't quite follow and I couldn't really understand what was going on. So if you can just summarize briefly what was done yesterday, I would appreciate it. Sure. So um, yesterday uh, we talked about um, what is data science? Right, and uh, it's really the combination of uh, math, um, statistics, um, computer science, and information science. Right, we need the math because that's um, how the algorithms are are cracked, um, especially now that partial, partial differential equations are being used. Um, we use statistics because that's the language we speak. We still have to sample. Um, when we compare things, we have to use statistics to say that something is or is not more valid. Um, we use computer science because, you, you know, as you have seen, the problems are now um, big data problems. And so um, once you enter into that problem, the, the solution is usually solved by using distributed systems from computer science. So you end up having uh, programmers and distributed systems to help you. And then we use information science, right? Because the data has to be gardened, it has to be cared for. Uh, and um, uh, that is, those are like the pillars, if you will, right? Uh, and then we talked about a couple of, um, we talked about decision trees uh, and um, what they're able to do. We talked about mining um, and a couple of ways to do that, association rules, uh, decision trees, clustering, uh, and um, decision trees attack a problem just like you would, right? You look at input variables and you look at output variables and you try to say which one is the best predictor, right? And what it does is it also ranks them in terms of which, once you find out which is the best, uh, you can graphically represent that uh, in a tree. And we'll see that today. And let's see what else. We talked about the difference between rules-based systems and machine learning systems. Rules-based systems are uh, yes, if you're not speaking, if you could mute because there's some feedback coming through, thank you. Um, Rules-based systems are based on uh, computer logic that programmers write, and machine learning systems are based on data that has been curated, uh, either um, through unsupervised means when it's been collected, uh, and the system learns from that, or from supervised means where you have data labelers involved. Um, and you'll see today uh, we're going to go through um, and build a model which does not use, um, you know, which is a which is an ML system, right? It's not a rules-based system. So uh, let's see what I think. Those are the highlights of what we covered yesterday. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much. The same, you're welcome. The same problem. I find it difficult to join yesterday. In fact, I had to con start the Joshua group, they have to lead me to link. Before we link, you had finished. So where do we get the materials for the lectures so that we can devise on our own? Yeah, so the you can get it from Codio, right? And you can also get it from the GitHub link. So um, let me go to GitHub and I'll post that now. <clears throat> So let me post this link. This is the link to all of it, and then I'm going to take you straight to module one. Okay. Oh, the recorded video. Nana has the Nana. You said that it'll be available after lecture. I think, right? Yes, that's right. It'll be, we'll post the link after um, on Slack at the end of the day for uh, day one yeah. and day two. That's great. Were you looking for the lectures, or are you looking for the recorded link? Both. Great, so let me pass the link in the chat now. Okay. And we'll add the, um, it has the lecture notes now, 
uh, and I'll add the notebook uh, as well as the files so that you guys have access to that after we get done. Okay. Yeah. For now, we'll do it uh, within Codio. Um, but yeah, great question. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Um, okay, let's get started. All right, so within Codio, as you click into the environment, um, you should have a tab. Okay, you should have a tab which is um, basketball cross validated auto low score final. It may say run as well, but uh, you all, and if you click on it, you should see this. This is Jupiter. So um, if you can't see it, let us know or just add into the chat that you're having um, um, issues with Codio. I'm watching the chat. Um, looks like, is there any code to access Codio? Um, AG. None of this should just, uh, yes, then can everybody please turn your microphone off? Thank you. Great. Uh, Richard, is that better now? Or I think we still have some feedback. Hopefully, I think we have it. Um, we have it. Um, feedback from Emmanuel Akala, if he can switch off his microphone. Thank you. Yeah, everybody turn off your mic. That's great. Okay, so um, please post in the chat if you're having any technical difficulties or to Slack. Um, the TAs will help you pick up. Um, and also, I can stop to help you as well. So, all right. So, um, let me just give you a tour of what this is, right? What you're looking at is uh, Jupiter, right? Jupiter is a, uh, an IDE, an, an interactive development environment, that is entirely web-based. Uh, pretty miraculous, right? Uh, I remember having to use Eclipse or you know, Visual Studio, which install you know, massive packages onto your uh, desktop, memory hogs. Uh, and it also is you know, much harder to share, right? Once you've done something, how do you move things? And um, you'll see Jupyter kind of does everything in one place. Uh, this is Jupyter itself. This is Jupyter Notebook. There is another variant of Jupyter called Jupyter Lab. Um, they are similar. I prefer Jupyter Lab. Uh, only because um, it, I think its dark theme is a little bit more beautiful, right? Uh, and it's a little bit easier to share a session within it. But they are effectively the same, right? They're running Python kernels. And um, okay, so you know it looks like a, a regular desktop tool. Right? You have a file menu where you can save things. You have an edit menu where you can cut cells. I'll talk about cells in a second. Um, you can toggle views. Uh, insert cells above or below. Um, you can see the concept of cells is very prominent, right? So this is a cell, right? Uh, this is the cell's output. That's what happens. So you have a cell where you enter in input, and then that cell runs, and this is the output of that cell. And that's how the majority of uh, the notebook will work, right? So inputs and outputs. Um, these numbers tell you the execution, right? So this is the 35th execution of this cell. Uh, you can see we've done some debugging, right? So 35th, actually this is 35, then 36 is the next cell that executed 37. So this is the 37th execution overall. And, okay, and that's the out for this, right? And let's see, so then you have kernel. Okay, so the kernel is what language you're using, and also what variant of Python. Um, you'll, you'll see that Jupyter can run things like um, there's plugins for R, there's plugins for Java now. Um, so you can use this environment with other programming languages, uh, as well as different kernels. And kernels are basically uh, um, packaged versions of the programming language. So uh, this is Python 3, and it's a basic installation. Um, but you would see there are other kernels such as Python 3 with TensorFlow, which has um, deep learning libraries added to it. Uh, the good news is because we're on the internet, um, if you don't have the library you need in the kernel, you can install it by using this uh, pseudo pip3 install and then the name of the package. 
and we'll talk about uh, what some of these uh, packages are. Uh, so, and with the kernel, you can interrupt it, stop the process where you are. If you start it, restart clear output, restart and run all. We do that a lot, right? Um, you'll see why in a, in a bit. Um, and then um, you can save the notebook as a widget, right? Um, and then help over here, right? So it's um, pretty, you'll see it becomes much more intuitive. Save plus button for cells. You can't see my mouse, right? But um, I think you can see me hovering. So cut, copy, paste, move up and down a cell, run, right? We'll be hitting the run button a lot. Uh, stop, uh, restart the kernel with dialog, restart the kernel and run everything. Right, this is the most often reused button. Uh, the view that you're in, you can say you can either be in code, markdown, raw and vegan converter heading. Uh, everything today we're doing is code, but you can also use markdown. What that does is um, instead of me having, say, comments up here as to what's happening, you could have something that is, um, you know, an image embedded or math mathematical formulas embedded or, you know, chemistry chains in embedded. And um, that will render here, right? There's a syntax for markdown. Uh, it's very elaborate. So today we're just looking at code, and um, you can open the command palette, and then you can validate, right? And this basically has the interpreter run through to see if there's anything wrong. Um, okay, so uh, if you have questions, interrupt me. I'll, I'll try to push through so that we can get uh, as much as we can get done here. Um, we will get through the notebook uh, no matter what, um, so I, I'll have to go fast at certain portions, but um, I'll make sure that we get the executions in, and then we'll go back for some of the finer details. All right. Um, okay. So Python uh, is a programming language, and each of these programming languages have their ups and downs. Okay. Python took the stance that it wanted to remove a lot of um, extra punctuation, right? And so it, 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 you know, we've been typing semicolons for the longest. All the Java programmers in the audience know what I'm talking about. The C, C++ programmers know what I'm talking about. And the, the reality is, is that um, we would do something like this so that, you know, if we had another uh, line, another set of code, um, the compiler knew that, all right, you know, this is a different statement, right? But each of us are basically writing things on different lines. Okay. So, Python omitted the semicolon. Um, Python also realized that when we would indent, um, a whole lot of us would, you know, we're doing this, right? And you see how it auto indented? Okay, that's great. But they said, do you really need um, the braces if the code is indented, right? I, I indented. All right, you can see that this is a sub uh, section to this larger section out here, the upper section. So they removed uh, the curly braces, right? I'm, uh, I'm actually happy about that one because uh, I don't know, um, I'm, and I'm curious, uh, some people like to write code like this, where they'll have the start, uh, say it's the, the function, and then they'll have the curly brace here, and then the code comes here, you know, whatever it is, right? And some people like to code like this, right? And so there's, yeah, such and such, right? And uh, this difference is uh, religious, right? It can be quite heated. So Python has removed that altogether. And so everything is based off indentation. It's very important, right? You'll get lost debugging Python if you don't indent correctly. The good news is that Jupyter does it for you, right? So if I, uh, you'll see when we go into a for loop, it will automatically, um, well, you have to tell it that you're going into a for loop and then it will indent you appropriately, right? Okay, so I'm gonna step through this uh, cell by cell, line by line for the highlights, um, and then uh, stop me if you have questions, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is install pandas, right? So what this line is saying is, um, this is a, um, a directive, to have the stack underlying this Jupyter, the, the, if you will, the, the computer that is hosting this for us, um, uh, run the pip3 command. Right? There's, there's two big ways to update your Python um, stacks or environments. One is pip, uh, the other one is conda. We're using pip3 here. Uh, 
Um, PIP is PIP three is specific to Python three, the latest version, and uh, and that's because you could have multiple Pythons on your computer, and you could have multiple PIPs. So this is saying use PIP three specifically, and what we're going to do is we're going to install pandas, right? And pandas is one of the more remarkable libraries in Python. Um, I'm going to say it's up there with NumPy. Uh, and what Pandas does is it basically gives you um, uh, a in-memory table of your data. Right now, before, if you wanted to do this and you wanted to be able to, you know, pivot around the data and be able to slice it up and sort, you had to build a user interface. You know, you had to do something like ASP.NET or you had to build, um, you know, a PHP interface um, so that you could share this and say, look, you know, look at what this looks like. Um, but here, Pandas very beautifully uh, output tables and allows you to sort very quickly right within this notebook, right? Right within these screens. So you don't have to go anywhere else. Uh, okay, so uh, so we're going to install it. And then after you install it, Python has the syntax of import, a module, and then you can give it a alias, right? So rather than having to write pandas dot whatever, we're going to say import pandas as pd. So pd is what is, um, uh, how we will refer to the pandas libraries from here. Uh, chances are you will be using pandas in just about any data science AI project you use, right? It's how we cut up data. You'll see when the data gets gigantic, there are some things um, that you won't be able to do in pandas, but um, there are tools to help you uh, deal with that. Um, either chunking, which is reading it in uh, piece by piece, but you have to know which piece to read, right? Um, there's a library called DAS, which is catching on now, uh, which basically allows you to have distributed uh, data frames, these tables that are moved out of your memory, the other um, servers that you have access to. And so you can treat it as a single table, even though it's all over the place. Uh, and that allows you to deal with gigantic amounts of data. Uh, and then also Spark, right? So Spark is another way of dealing with this, which uses um, Spark data frames, which you can then uh, convert back to Panda data frames if you need to. If you do the large data engineering and big data work in Spark, bring back what you need and then present in um, uh, Python and Pandas. So, okay, so that's Pandas. NumPy uh, is, um, this is what, the preferred um, uh, array for Python. And this NumPy is extraordinarily unique because they fill the gap of what arrays could do in Python, and they've taken it to points where you're running all kinds of sophisticated um, mathematical operations on arrays. So, for example, um, NumPy allows you to find the derivative of, um, you know, series that you store in arrays. Right, so, um, or, or fit lines towards it, right? You'll see, if we get time, I'll show you guys some of the um, COVID work we've done. And that is largely based on NumPy uh, regression fits. So also NumPy is the primary library used by TensorFlow and Keras. And um, it, it's so much so that it should be, TensorFlow should be renamed to NumPy Flow. Um, you'll see that um, when we talk about TensorFlow, um, it's really just NumPy arrays being moved around and being used in you know, matrix multiplication and uh, taking derivatives uh, of those arrays. So um, you'll see some work with NumPy today as well. So this is basically high-powered arrays. Uh, Pandas is high-powered data frames that you can see right on the, on the screen. Okay, so then sklearn, right? Some of, I'm sure some of you have dealt with sklearn. Some of you, some people will call it scikit-learn. The install for it is uh, sklearn. That's the legacy uh, name for it. They refer to it as scikit. Uh, and this is the most popular um, traditional machine learning library for Python. 
Um, you can get clustering out of it. You can get classification out of it, decision trees out of it. Um, and there's a lot of uh, regression work that comes out of it. Uh, and we'll be using it today um, to do decision trees. Um, there are other libraries as well, but uh, SKLearn is really, really well documented and, and quite, quite beautiful. Uh, easy to use, right? So we're going to install SKLearn, and then we are going to um, um, reference one of its libraries. And uh, an extraordinarily important library, uh, particularly for classification, is uh, confusion matrices, right? And so uh, confusion matrices lets you identify um, not only the accuracy of your model, but how well did you do when it comes to false positives? How well did you do when it comes to false negatives? Uh, what is the sensitivity? What is the recall? Um, the confusion matrices um, graphically depict that, so you can see it very easily. So, okay, so I'm going to execute this cell. You can execute along with me if you like. You should see uh, some warnings, right, because of the Codeo environment, but it is basically installing these packages for you, right? Uh, and once you'll, when it's in operation, you'll see a star. Once the star is gone, that means it's completed, okay? And uh, it's okay. So here we're going to read in some data. And before we do that, let's just take a look at this data. To do that, you can click on View. Uh, click on File Tree, right? And you should have a file called uh, CellFixData.csv, so you can open this file. That's okay. You can say yes. All right. And what this is is um, the games the Celtics played. Uh, I think this is in the twenty two thousand yeah twenty season. And what you have here is the team, right? So um, Boston played the Wizards. I'll go through the first line. So um, it's Boston data, uh, Boston at the Washington Wizards on January 6th, uh, 2020. Um, Boston lost, okay? Um, there was 240 minutes in the game. Uh, it was 94 points, right? Uh, and then the field goals made were 33. Field goals attempted in 95, uh, field goal percentage 34.7, three-pointers made um, eight, three-pointer percentage, um, uh, what is that, 21.6, is that what it is? So well, there's a whole bunch of basketball statistics here. You'll see when we render it in a pandas data frame, it'll look much better. But, uh, and then I'll walk through the various columns. But the idea here is we're going to look at um, the how the Celtics uh, statistics of how the Celtics played against other teams, and see if we can figure out what were the important variables for the Celtics to win. Right. So you know, can was it the amount of three pointers they made? Right. Is it the amount of uh, rebounds they had? Right. What are the critical variables and the values of those variables that contributed to a either a win, sorry, either a win or a loss for this team, right? So as you apply it to data sets that you're looking at, you can say, okay, look, I have all this data, right? And I have them in columns, and I want to target a particular value. Now, decision trees don't, you can have decision trees with multiple output variables, right? Nothing stops you from doing that. For simplicity, we're looking at a single output variable, which is win or loss, right? So for you, you may be looking at, you know, these are the uh, values I had for some study, and I want to, you know, target this output variable. And so you would set the output variable as uh, either win or, win or loss for us, whatever it is for you, and then you can pick which of these variables um, you want to use within the study. Now, there's only one caveat to this, uh, and that is you have to pick, first you have to pick your output variable. Okay, so I'm gonna pick wins and loss, because I wanna know what was it that made the Celtics win, okay? Uh, and um, then you wanna pick your input variables, but the, the thing is you wanna make sure that the input variables, right, and this is the only caveat, uh, are not directly related to the output variable, right? They're not effectively the same. So for example, um, 
for wins and loss, um, you know, it's, it's loss or win here, right? So W or L. And if I had chosen plus or minus, okay, uh, plus or minus is the amount of points they either won or lost by, okay? So the decision tree would spot this, as I, if I chose plus or minus as the input variable, the decision tree would spot this and say, oh, any time that plus or minus is negative, you lose, right? And any time plus or minus is positive, you win, right? And I would say, yeah, I know that because these are basically the same variable, right? They're indicating the same thing. So what you want is you want to get a variable that functions that, that is independent, right? Uh, that is not exactly the same um, dependence as the output variable, right? So, <clears throat> so you identify your data set, remove the variables um, that are, you could say, co-occurrent with the um, output variables you have, and then you can just run it, right? So, um, so okay. So let's take a look at the um, notebook again. Okay. So now we know what the data is about. Let's uh, run this cell and read it in. Okay. And so that reads it in, and then to get an output of the table, you can just output the variable name, right? So what this did is we said pandas library. Okay. So pandas library read the CSV file called celticsdata.csv. There are a bunch of parameters you can pass to it, but so long as the file is um, delimited by uh, commas, uh, pandas will be able to make sense of it, right? So I'm going to run this same thing, but I'm just going to leave the variable as the last uh, value in the cell. And when you do that, you get the um, contents of the table, right? Pandas has truncated uh, some of these so that it's easier to see. You can remove that um, uh, by setting some flags. I'll leave it here for now because we don't need to go through all of it. Um, but this is basically what it is, right? We're looking at these input variables. Uh, these are the variables in the data. We're going to select down on the input variables, and then we're going to pick a output variable and see if we can determine what are the features and values that contribute towards wins and losses. Right? What do they have to do uh, in order to be successful? Okay. All right. So, and these are the rows that we had in that CSV file. So automatically, you know, you get some highlighting straight away. Um, it renders right here, and and just this for the Java programmers in the audience, just this is like, oh my god, right? So you can imagine having to brief leadership and say, okay, look, here's the data, um, and at this point, you're already you know doing well. Okay. 34 rows, 24 columns, there we go. So first thing we're gonna do uh, is we're going to set uh, what are the uh, output variables that we're targeting, right? What are the dependent variables that we want to be able to predict against? And um, here we're gonna store that in a variable called labels. And so we're saying labels is equal to the data frame name is P, okay? So, uh, and this what this does is this is another incredible thing about pandas, right? So you have this data frame, table in memory, right? And you want to be able to get uh, a particular column of it. All you have to do is say uh, P and then bracket, and then the string of the column name, right? Uh, and that will give you back the sequence, right, uh, of those columns, right? So here's the indices, and then here are the values, right? So rather than looking at all of this, we want to down select to a particular variable, and this is how you do that. Right? You can also do things like uh, p dot. Um, yeah, so you can see if the name is um, doesn't have any special characters in it, you can also do something like p dot defensive rebound, and it'll complete for you, right? Wins and loss has the slash in it, so if, to avoid any issues, you can put through a string in here for the uh, exact name of the column. Okay, so. Again, stop me if you have any questions, All right? So uh, we run this, we get the labels out. Great. Now this is important, right? You have to figure out what features uh, you want to use as input and independent variables. Uh, I'm taking just about everything except that plus or minus, right? Now, uh, if you have a data set which is gigantic, 
uh, and you run it and you find, you know, you're unable to find these variables that are effectively the dependent variable as well, right? Uh, don't fret, you'll see it in the model uh, output and you'll see that this is always the case. When this value is this, this is that, uh, this is, you know, always a win or a loss, let's say. Um, and after you run the model, you'll spot that and you can just eliminate it from the input variable. So, in fact, that's what happened for me, right? I did not spot plus or minus the first time I ran this. The model came back saying, hey, all you have to worry about is plus or minus. Don't worry about anything else. And I said, okay, yes, because they're the same value, right? Plus is when it's positive, they've won. And when it's negative, they've lost. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're going to take points. Uh, some other statistics from this, free throws made, free throws attempted, offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds, rebounds in total, assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, and personal fouls. Um, okay. Turnovers, for those who don't know, is when they lose the ball. Personal fouls is when they foul somebody. Right? So this is the amount of fouls um, that the Celtics had. Okay. All right. So we're going to store that in features as we run this. Let me make sure that... Okay, yeah. So, and you can see this numbering is important now, right? So, we just ran this, and I have this number of four over here. N is four, right, right to the left of this. You see, N is four. And over here, I have N is 38, which means that since they're not in order, this means this was from a prior session, right? So, um, that'll help you know as you do this over and over again, um, you want to make sure you execute each cell. A fast way to get around that is to hit this button, the double arrows which is restart the kernel and then run the whole notebook all over again. That makes sure that everything gets executed in order. You clear everything from memory and run. Um, normally, I would do that. Sure. Is there a particular reason why the features start with the point and you kind of like, kind of like left the team match up and game did? Uh, so the question is, um, why did we start with points? Yeah, right. when you start select the features, like the set features, it, for the independent variable. Yeah, yeah. So I just took them in order as they came out of the CSV file. Um, but we removed uh, minutes because um, it's always the same, right? And then I didn't want to have game date. And this is a good question. So I didn't want to have game date be involved because um, the date would never be the same. So it's, it's not really relevant. Uh, and it would not be, well, it may have caused problems, right? It may have said that, oh, on such and such date, you know, this is the, you know, you win or lose, right? So we didn't want to judge it by time as well. So, so it, yeah. yes, so technically that's where you start analyze the data to see, okay, all right, this feature is not going to be part of my testing and training because it's not matter, but is there, is there, is there a chance that you work in for a company, like a financial industry company, and um, <clears throat> for that day, and they have so much transaction, they want to know for that specific day, for that specific time, what was the transactions? How how you're gonna train and test the data to see if the stock market goes up, goes down for that specific date and that specific time? Yeah. So then, okay, that's a great question, right? So then you can include um, the date. Right, and what would happen is, is you'd have to have multiple occurrences of it, right? So you need to, let's say you wanted to know what happened on the first day of every month uh, in the stock market, right? Uh, then what would happen is, is you'd have to include dates, right? Uh, and you would do, you have to do a little bit of massaging of the data at that point because um, one six twenty twenty is not going to be one six twenty twenty one, right? Um, but you would. Um, Keep the date in there. You'd have to do some formatting of the values, and then um, you could send through the formatted date column uh, as the independent variable. Nothing precludes you from using date values, but you'd need to have multiples of the same day uh, to do the analysis I talked about. You could also say things, if you didn't have multiples, the, the decision tree would start saying things like, okay, on let's say Friday the 13th, if that was one of our data points, um, the market crashed, right? It sees it as a unique value, and if it was a crash on that day, it would identify it. Now, the problem is that may be coincidental, right? So, at the end of the day, you still have to look at it, but the machine sees it as this unique set 
uh, of inputs yielded this unique output. Does that answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yeah, very good. It's an excellent question. Yeah. So, um, so nothing precludes us from using this. In fact, um, the data that I'm looking at in uh, Arcos currently, um, we group by days, right? And we look at the total amount of uh, uh, pills that were sent uh, per day, and we judge uh, whether or not uh, there's too many pills going out per day, right? And we can see that as a time series. Um, and so what, what that means is for the SQL folks in the room, uh, you can group by. Right, and you can group by right out of pandas, right? So before, if you wanted to do group by, you had to get down to the database level, you had to understand SQL, and you have to say, okay, I want to group by this column, and then I want to, you know, say I want all, like you had mentioned, all the transactions for a particular date, right? So that becomes something like this, p dot, you see this group by, right? And then you can specify in here, shift tab gives you the sequence. So let me show you that again, right? So if you come in here, you have the variable name and you hit period, right? And then tab, that will tell you what is available to you. These are all the fields and columns, right? I think I'm understanding your question more now. So I want to take the group by function. We'll have some fun, right? So let's do the group by, right? And uh, now I'm going to say open parentheses. And here you have the by, okay? And let's here you can, and the by over here is going to be the field, okay? And then you want to be able to say um, what you want to sum it by, right? So you can actually, let's increase this, right? Uh, the other thing is Python's documentation is pretty good, right? So they'll give you examples of how you can do this, right? The sort of it. Add something quick, I didn't want to interrupt you. If someone asks, how did you get that? They just have to do shift tab and it should That's be right. able inside a parentheses and you will see the documentation. That is exactly right. Yeah. And so, you know, here's an example why, yeah, we'll do, we'll do this one, right? So let's grab the group by, uh, um, and I'm going to take it as this. Well, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So let's have some fun. Let's do uh, e dot group by, I'm going to group it by date. All right. So game date. Uh, and this is going to be odd because it's a day, though, right? On a game date, we need another column in here. So, oh, it didn't pick it up yet. So, what is game date in as? Come back here. Do this again. E. Game date is in here. Let's see if I can. Oh, uh, it might have been practically the case. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. So let's do it by the by game date. This the mean is not going to make sense. Let's look at this again. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to get the count of let's say I don't know assists or something. So. So wait, yeah, okay. So by B and then sum, it's going to try to sum everything outside of it. But let's try it like this, okay? So what's this? Sum? Still, the game date key doesn't come up. Hmm. One sec. Am I spelling it wrong? Yeah, game date is in caps. Oh, it's all caps. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, so I, I, I think uh, there is something, there is an ASCII code for the space. I, I actually tried it out. It's a slash. I'll put it in the in the chat. So you see it oh, as a space, you. but it's actually not a space. Yeah. Yeah. Let me look at the chat. I'll put it, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Give me a moment. Thanks. Okay. Sometimes so, I can be that kind of situation, and I really don't know because the. The error doesn't really tell you exactly what caused the error because even though you put the game date the same way it is, it still does not recognize game date. Yeah, I think it's an ASCII issue over here. Yeah. Um, let's try. 
escape the space character. It could be that as well. Let's try a different column to be sure. So let's take, where are we? Run. I have it over here. Let's take free throws made. Okay, free throws made. So that's FTM. Free throws made. Yeah, okay. So, right. So there's an ASCII character that's going on with the game day. We'd have to look at that. Uh, and we can try to escape it out. I'll come back to this. But this is basically giving you, uh, on this day, there were this many free throws made. All right, and I think it's summing, yeah, 22 plus or minus, right? So you can group by just like this. And so if we were to change this, right, so this is the amount of free throws made. So you can say, I think you can add also into here. So let's say free throws made and field goals attempted. And this is to illustrate how quickly you'll be able to group by. All right, so now what this is saying is you had five free throws on this day in total, and this many field goals attempted and the rest of this. But what you really want is that you want it by day, but here each day is unique as well, right? But um, this gives you an example. I'll come back for the ASCII code when we go to break. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. But that is how you would do it. X20, let's, uh, William's got it. Let's try it, right? So one last try for this same date. And you're saying, let me look at the chat. Um, I'm, I'm just pulling the window up. Okay, so it's like a walk and an X twenty. Backslash twenty. Yeah, I'm gonna try that. Yeah. X X twenty X twenty. It's a walk X twenty. X twenty. Not lower X. Is it lower? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lower X. Let's try that. Otherwise, I'll go look for it some more. Yeah, give, so give that escapes me. out the, oh, I missed it here, yeah. So we need it here. Again, game date. There's some type of, let's look in the Oh, yeah, give, give me a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right, we'll come back for this. Okay, so, um, all right, let's keep going here. So we have, now we have to pick the output variable, right? And that is, um, I just set it as labels. You can set it as whatever you like. And it's going to be the, um, for us, it's wins or losses. That's how it's displayed in the data. Let's go back up here. Let me run this again to be clean. All right, so for us, it is this column, right? Okay. So, all right, so then here are all the output labels, right? Uh, we did that already, right? Now here's the features, we did that. Okay, good. All right, so now, after you've picked your uh, independent variable, okay, uh, now you need to get, this is just an, you know, the, an, an, a list of them, right? Here's a list of the independent variables you want. Now you need to tell the pandas data frame to locate, this is the Python um, syntax for all rows, Okay, so the first in, first value is all rows, okay? And we want just these columns. And the columns are the list of the independent variables that we've specified, right? So we're gonna store that in capital X, and then we're gonna output capital X, right? So, um, oh, because I didn't execute features, right? So again, 38 and four, all right? So now let's execute this. Okay, all right, uh, and that's because we executed this one a whole bunch of times. That's why the number went up. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, the features executed now. Features has the list of independent variables we're looking at. And now when we execute this, we're gonna get uh, just the data frame with the independent variables, points, Etc. right, all the way down to personal files. Okay, so um, we're doing okay on time. All right, so now we're gonna set up plotting, right? We wanna be able to visualize this to some degree. 
Um, you'll see that we need this for uh, the confusion matrices and we'll need it for um, the display of the decision tree. So uh, the library that's used for that is Matplotlib. Matplotlib is really quite amazing. Um, you can take a NumPy array and tell it to plot and you'll get uh, a, uh, a, um, a um, uh, scatter plot or line plot instantly from it, right? So we're going to use this a little bit further down, but this is how you import it. And over here, we're setting the sizes, right? So the first one is the left to right, the column size. And the second parameter here is the uh, depth, the row sizes, right? And there's a couple of ways to do this. I set this globally, right? Um, I'm not really sure. Okay, yeah. So I set this uh, globally, and then we're going to save it in the um, uh, matplotlib um, parameters for this notebook. Okay. So once more, grabbing the setting the independent sorry the dependent variable into uh, capital Y. So we have independent variables uh, in X, and now we have. Uh, dependent variables in Y, and this is a single column for us, right? So we don't need the entire data frame. Right? So we just have wins and losses in Y. All right, so let me, I'm going to execute everything again. All right, so let's execute this. Run. You can also hit Control Enter. All right, that'll run it for you. Um, okay, and so 22. All right, and we have this. Okay, so there's the output of the uh, independent uh, variable, or the dependent variable. Okay, so and here comes the AI portion of this, right? So uh, we're going to import uh, sklearn. I've done this just because I wanted to know which Python version I was on, right? Because uh, sometimes there are incompatibilities between these two. It's very rare, um, but uh, I don't know, just for um, debugging purposes, that's there. Uh, and we are going to import um, tree, which is the decision tree from sklearn, and we're going to import um, model selections cross valve score. And this is extraordinarily important. Um, I'll talk more about this as we get down there into the middle book, but the, the point of it is uh, we don't, as we, okay. Uh, when you are sampling from the file, right? Um, and this this is how this uh, stuff is cut up. You have to take some of the some of the data as training and some of the data as test. Right? There's actually you know good reasons to use a third data set, which is validation. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Maybe at the end of lecture we can talk about that if we get to it. But the concept holds, right? You need a certain amount of data that you're going to use to say, all right, this is what I want you to learn about. All right, I want you to analyze this data and come up with what you think the patterns are, right? Uh, and then you want to run what, and so this, this, okay, so you've done that, the model now has a brain, right? It's sitting there saying, okay, I have learned these patterns, I am ready to make predictions. Okay, but you have to test that, and you have to say, okay, how good are you at making predictions? And the way you do that is you have a test set, right? So uh, what you can do is you can take your um, training, you can take your entire data and split some of it into uh, training and some of it into test. Okay. And so the scientists in the room are going to say, well, how do you know how to split it? And where do you draw the line? Right? Perfect. Enter cross-validation. What cross-validation does is it looks at the, the file you have Right, the data set that you have, and depending on how many you know slices you want, typically people take four to five slices, um, and that amounts to a um, a uh, tw seventy five to uh, twenty five split or an eighty twenty split between training and test. Right, uh, and ideally you would want fifty fifty. It depends on how much data you have. Okay, so what will happen is is the cross validation will look at okay, this file, and it'll cut, right? I'll draw this for you, but I'm just giving you a high level of this. It'll cut the file up into pieces and say, I'm going to use these, say, 20 records as training, and I'm going to use these 
um, let's say, five records of tests for this run, okay? And you'll get a model that way, okay? Based on that portion of the file uh, of training and that portion of the file for test. And then it'll do the same thing for the remaining training and test. And what it does is it, so it, it cuts up the training and test without us interfering, uh, and it makes sure that every training and test value is used, right? Uh, and you'll see the mechanics of this in a minute, but um, that keeps us from saying, oh, you know, I want to use the first half of the file. Why? Or I want to use the first 25% of the file, or maybe these values that I know give me great training results, right? Um, so cross-validation is a way for you to do that without much bias. Okay, you eliminate a lot of it. There's still some there because you have to say um, how many folds you want. And there's ways to negate that too, but it deals with looking at all the possibilities for folds and then looking at a point for diminishing returns. So uh, a bit more advanced, but we can talk about that as well. All right, so that is what this is about, okay? Um, you have to figure out how to sample from the data and avoid bias as best you can, okay? All right. So we're importing that, and I'm going to execute this. All right, here's where we set it, okay? And so we're going to have five folds, right? This amounts to an 80-20 split, and um, we're going to use a decision tree. This random state says there are, there are variables that are used internally to decide um, which columns to look at. Right, and we're going to use random state equal to zero so that those values are always generated the same for us. And that allows you to have decision trees that don't change, right? So you show it to leadership, they say great, and if you were to show it to them again, depending on the, the variable you use, you may have a slightly different tree, right? Um, but by setting random state equal to zero, you'll get the same trees each time. Okay, so this is a real shorthand method over here now. So cross val score. It's going to take this decision tree model, which doesn't know anything right now. You've just got this object, right? CLF is what we've called it. And it's going to take the X, which is the input data. Yes, random state is like setting the seed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yes, Eugene, the lecture is recorded. We'll post the, um, uh, we'll post the link to this uh, recorded session uh, after this. So, okay, so we have the model, okay, is going to get the input variables, the output variables, and it's going to take the cross-validation folds of five, okay? And what that does is it will create, let's run it real fast too, right? Okay, so these are the accuracies of each of the models that we ran on the with the decision tree on our data. Straight away, right? So you had one of them that scored at 85%, one at 57%, 57%, 71%, and 66%. So what you can see is depending on where you slice the data, where you decide what's training and what tests will give you varying results, right? Now, another reason we do this is because um, you have to you have to, you don't have all the data, right? Um, if you had all the data, you could just simply look at it and say, this is the case, right? But there's data being uh, generated, there's data that we don't know about. So you, you have to build this model to run on data that it's not seen before, right? If a model has training data and it learns everything about it, it's going to nail it. You send that training data back through again, the model knows everything about this data. We just analyzed it, no problem. Right, um, but you need it to make predictions on data it's not seen before, right? And one way to do that is to cross-validate as well, right? You are looking at five different scenarios of what this model did when it did not know what the incoming data was going to be, right? So it gives you, this is a subtlety, this gives you an idea of how this model will perform in the wild, right? Yes, you got 85% once, but you also got 57%, right? So, um, so this is a shortcut, right? We're gonna actually delve into what this does, um, but that is the idea, 
right? You need it for training and test, and you also need it so you can say, this is what we think this is going to do in the wild when, it, when we have not seen the data, which is what's important, okay? All right, so from this, right, we get the scores variable, okay? And um, I'll try to pick up the pace. Let's hope, I'm gonna try to get the end notebook executed by one so we can ask questions about it. Um, okay, so we can calculate the accuracy, right? Uh, we can take the scores mean, we can take the standard deviation times two, that gives us two deviations out on each side, so we can talk about a confidence uh, interval, um, and then divide by the square root uh, of k, which for us was five, right? And so when you do that, right, this gives you, um, six, the average accuracy is 68%, plus or minus 0 0.09, right, when we ran it this way, okay? So um, not, Great, but better than 50-50, right? Perhaps enough for you to do something on FanDuel, I don't know. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a betting man, so, um, but this is an example, right? Like, we would use much more data, uh, we would have many more features, uh, variables, but this gives you an idea of what's happening, right? Okay, so from debugging of the scores, you can, and any Python variable, you can type, you can type the word type, and put it inside here and it'll tell you what it is. So this is confirming to you that scores is a NumPy array, right? And, and I didn't set it to be that way. You can see that Scikit internally is using NumPy, right? So it's heavily embedded uh, throughout the APIs. Okay, so now we're gonna do some bookkeeping for the plot, right, of the decision tree. So, um, They've used NumPy internally, no problem. We're gonna use it again here. This is actually uh, Duke because I think we've got it up here as well. I'm pretty sure we imported, yes. So this is an extra NumPy and strike that from here. All right, this is a Duke. All right, and so we're going to do, we're gonna take the unique uh, labels. This is needed for the display of the decision tree. Uh, we're gonna sort them in um, alphabetical order and uh, then get a unique list of that and put it into this sorted variable. So you can see that when we run that, it comes back and says, you know, all these losses and wins amount to the two variables, where are we? Or the two values, uh, L and W. Okay. Once more, looking at the data, before we go in, you'll see we'll need this when we see the decision tree. Okay, so I'm just gonna run that again. All right, and here's, where some of the complexity is in this model. Um, we're going to create uh, another data frame. So we're creating an internal data frame now where we're gonna keep the score of each model and the model itself, right? You don't have to do this. I'm doing this to illustrate um, how they can differ, right? And how you can choose one of the models to, to run if you wanted to. So this is just a blank data frame at this point. It doesn't have anything except these two columns no data inside it. So now what we're gonna do is run that same k-folds we did up top, but we're gonna actually generate the decision trees for each of those models so you can see them, right? Normally you would not have to do this, but I'm doing this so that you can see the internals of what's happening, right? And, um, okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, import k-folds, right? This is setting up the k-folds object, right? So we're gonna do it with five, uh, we're going to shuffle the data beforehand to remove any other bias we have. We don't care about the time order in this model, right? So we can shuffle. Uh, random state again set to zero for the speed, as pointed out. Yeah. Okay. Um, a counter for the loop, so i equals zero, right? And then um, for each training index, this is a little bit of syntactic sugar now, right? So. Um, and this is a, a for and in loop in Python, right? This is about as complex as it's gonna get. So for each training index and test index that comes out of the k-fold split of the training data, right, of the in, input data, right? Um, and what this is saying is run this command, kf.split. Okay, kf.split is going to come back with a list of these training indexes and test indices, so take the first, uh, training index may be from zero to five, and test index may be uh, six and seven, right? And it's going to eliminate those 
uh, from the other analysis, right? So this is going to be the training, and this is going to be the test. And for each of those breakouts from this split, um, we are going to create a training set, test set. This is just using those breakouts. Training index, test index, yes. Okay, yes, yep, okay. Um, Question, Professor. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a specific reason why you didn't use a <clears throat> SKLN uh, that model underscore selection for the train test and split data? So the question is, why do we not use SKLearn? Um, that model so underscore selection and put train underscore test and underscore split. So you can split it like a 80% to 20%. You could. The, the difference is, uh, and you can split manually if you want to. The problem with splitting um, manually is first you only get one so if you split 80-20, nothing wrong with it. You can actually program SKLearn to uh, split randomly and shuffle as well, right? So that's fine, but you won't get multiple runs of it, right? So what you really want to do is you can say split 80-20, but do it a whole bunch of times so I get a distribution of what can happen. Because as we've seen, it depends on where you split uh, it, your accuracy is dependent upon where you split. So, right? and so, so you, yeah. I, I can split it 20, 80, and after that, I choose to do it randomly. So every time I run it, it's going to do it randomly. It's not going to specifically split it each time the way I want it. It's just going to split it randomly. Is that correct? That's correct. And the other thing that happens is, is if you run it repeatedly without using cross-validate, you can still use the same training data. Right, so even though you split 80-20 or 20-80, either way you go, those splits that you have may have data from the prior run. What cross-validation does is it says, I'm gonna split it, sorry, yeah, I'm gonna split it, uh, let's say five ways, and each of those five ways have entirely unique training data and test data. You see, because what if, it's unlikely, but what if you split 80-20, split 80-20 again, and maybe 95% of the data is the same? You wouldn't get the difference that you could possibly have. Right? So, does that make sense? You may be muted. Yeah. Interrupt me if it doesn't. Cross-validation is extraordinarily important. Um, you, you have to do it um, because it gives you the best estimation of how your model will run on data that you've not seen. And the best way to do that is to run simulations. The way that we run simulations here is to sample different training and test splits, right? And showing that each time we do it, they're entirely unique. Good, interrupt me if you, uh, if it doesn't make sense, yeah. Okay, um, good question. All right, so, all right, so we get the X trained, Right, X trained and test from this, and Y train and Y test from this. Now, this is a subtlety, right? So, what's happening is you have this X data, right, which you're using for X training data, which is what you're using to train the model on the, the independent variable. And you have the Y training data, which is the model, uh, that's the um, mapping, right? So, that's the wins or loss on the data that you want the model to learn from, okay? And let's, uh, let me see if I can get, I'll, I'll see if I can launch the annotation here to help. All right, so X train and Y train, right? Let me see here. So these two, all right, are used to, uh, this is for the learning, okay? All right, and these two, all right, are for the, uh, sorry, the test point. So let's do that. There's a bit of lag in the annotation. But X train and Y train, you can see my, I think, cursor moving around now. So X train and Y train give you the data that the model is going to learn on. Okay? And X test and Y test. Sorry, if you uh, if you can mute. Um, 
Let me stop that. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I apologize for the echo. I don't know what happened here. Yeah. All right. So, um, Nana, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I want to make sure I'm not muted. Yeah. I can hear you. Great. Thanks, Nana. Okay. So we take the X test and the Y test data, and that's going to be the portions of the data that we use to check against, right? Model has learned using the training data, and then we want you to say, okay, you're predicting that these values are going to be, let's say, a loss, right? But the test data is saying, no, it's in fact a win. Or you're correct, you predicted, given these variables um, that we looked at, uh, that it's a loss, and in the test data says, yes, in fact, it was a loss, right? And that's how we calculate the accuracy. Okay, so, all right, moving along, let me see here, yeah. I think I have to turn off annotations to scroll. Okay, yeah, so that's what this does. You train with the X and Y trains, you then predict. Okay, so the model is, it's, there's the brain, okay? At this point, model has learned, all right? For that train test, Model has learned. Then what happens is, is you're going to make the prediction based on the independent variables in the test data. It's a subtlety, right? You've trained the model on the training data, and now you're going to take the independent variables of the test data and generate the prediction of what the uh, dependent variable of the test data should be, okay? So that's prediction. And then what do we do? We get the score right, by looking at the X test data, which is known X, and then uh, the known Y data, right? So model has been trained. You can that you get the predictions here, and then you can send in to get the score for the model, um, the known, we call them known truth, the known X values and the known Y values, okay? All right, and this is just outputting that, right? And this is the average score, okay? And here comes the decision tree. We'll talk about the decision tree. Uh, when it renders, you assign that model that you created to the, um, uh, to the, the score of it and the model, right? So model that score is gonna go here. Increment the index in the data frame. This is used so that you know where to insert next time. And then plot the confusion matrices. Okay, um, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail, but let's run this so you get an idea of what's happening. Okay, so there are the train test splits. First time through, zero through 33, and we took tests as two and, you know, some spaces to 31. Okay, the model scored 71% when we did that, right? Uh, and then the average k score was here, all right? And then we take another train test split, okay, of zero, and then this one up to 32. Okay, there's some spaces in here, I think. Yes, yeah, so 10 is omitted, right? Uh, and then we take a different, uh, an entirely different um, test set, right? So these test sets are unique. See that? So then over here, this is also unique, right? Okay. And so this is using different splits and then different test sets. So the test sets you'll see will not repeat, right? Okay. So we cut it up several ways. Okay. All right. And we get different scores. And now let's walk through one of these. Okay. So the size of this is large. Let's see if I can get this to be a little bit better. So I'll take you through the first one, and then I'll move down to the, the final tree. Um, so what this is saying is when points, is less than or equal to 98. So when this condition is true, we're using a Gini impurity, which we'll talk about in a different lecture, but it's basically how consistent is the column, right? Uh, and this is the current consistency of the, the points column, right? Um, and, uh, okay, so there's 27 samples at this point, and um, there's seven that are, I think, lost, and seven that are win. Sorry, seven that are lost, 20 that are wins, and the class, the dominant class at this point is W. That's what you get this blue from. And so when this is true, we go left. In decision trees in Python, true is always to the left, okay? So when this is true, 
Uh, so they score more than 98 points, okay? Uh, the Celtics always lose. That's what this is saying, all right? So if the, sorry, less than 98, less than or equal to 98 points. So if the Celtics score less than 98 points, all right? They always lose. Let's go look, okay? So when the Celtics score less than 98 points, so 94, loss. Win, 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 win. Uh, now here's a loss, but it may not be always that it's 97, right? They found that if it's less than nine, oh no, it's 98 we said, yes? 98 was the factor? Yes, yeah, so it is 98, right? So yeah. So here we have 97, which is less, and that's a loss. 109, 117, they lost, but it wasn't always the case because at 109, you also won. You see? So the decision tree went through here and said, what is the case all the time? And that is one of the differences between decision trees and association rules. Association rules will tell you what happens a certain percentage of the time. 60% of the time this happens, 50% of the time this happens. Decision trees tell you what happened every time, all the time. It is definitive. Right? Um, and so, yeah, so again, less than 98, it's a loss, right? So one, there was another situation where there was 107 and they won. Let's see if we can find that. I think we saw that. Um, or there may be another variable involved with it. Yeah. But either way, yeah, so I'll come back on this one. But every time you had less than 98, it was a loss, for sure. Okay, so that's one of the things they found, right? Now, if you come over here, oh, did I jump the tree? Where did the, yeah, I think we, final error. Give me a second. We did that, we did that. Almost there, okay, yes, it's in here, okay. All right, so 98, if it's less than 98, it's a loss. And then if it's not um, less than 98, right, it depends on how many personal fouls they had. All right, so if it's above 98, so if it's 99 and above in points, because you can't have fractional points, if it's above 99, 98, greater than or equal to 99, uh, it depends on how many personal fouls they had. So if, so let's say the Celtics don't score, they score a lot, they score a few points, they lose, All right? You've got to score more than 98 points. Okay, so we score more than 98 points. Then it comes down to if you have less than 15 personal fouls, you lose, okay? So you tell them, all right, you need to score a lot of points. They go out and score a lot of points, okay? But it, now they can still lose if they have less than 15 personal fouls. What that means is they weren't as rough with the other team, right? The more fouls you have, the more contact there is, right? So let's look at that very quickly. So less than 15 fouls. So uh, do we have, okay, personal fouls, right? So uh, let's look at less than 15. So we have a situation here. Here we go, right? So here's that 107 as, as cited before, right? So 107 was a loss and it was greater than 98. Right, but they didn't have, they had very few personal fouls. You see, so you were automatically able to get this out of it. Let's look at another one. Here's 14 fouls, right? And again, they lost, but this one is, this is the case because it was less than 98. But this is the one that we had from before, right? This is also a loss and there's not another 107, but it's because they had few um, personal fouls. And you couldn't say 107 or lower because I bet here you have 105 and it's a win. You see? So the decision tree is cutting this up in ways that it would be daunting for a human to look at, right? Like looking at all these pivots, it's, it's overwhelming. Imagine you have, you know, so many variables you have to look at, so many rows you have to look at, and then multiply that by the amount of variables the combinations will explode on you, right? It's, it's beyond human uh, calculation. And so, okay, so the decision tree is doing this, we're getting this value, and I'll just walk through, right? So, so if it's less than 
uh, 15 fouls, you lose. If you have more than 15 fouls, so you were physical with the other team, scored a lot of points, and you were very physical, great. But if you turn the ball over uh, less than eight times, this is interesting. If you turn the ball over less than eight times, you lose. And you would think it's the other way. Turnovers are bad, right? So, um, so if you're going to score a lot of points, you need to uh, be very physical with the other team, and you have to turn the ball over at least nine times, and you win, right? So 20, 20 of the times that happened, right? And you know, sure enough, if we go back, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back, but sure enough, if we go back, we'll verify that this is the case, right? So, um, but this is also the case based on the split that we took. You can get a different decision tree depending on um, how you split the data, right? And let's talk about the confusion matrix for a second. This is a little bit harder to see, but I'll take you through this, right? So what you have here, let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. Mm. Let's see, that's from here. Um, where do we adjust that? Here. So we need it to be, let's make this five. All right, so that sets it globally, and then I'm going to come back here and run this method again. Okay, so that's better. All right, so same decision tree, okay? And this is really important. Anytime you have someone who is doing work in classification, particularly supervised classification models, you've got to see a confusion matrix. This is simplified because there's two variables, right? There's two values, either they won or they lost. And what you're looking at is uh, a visual way to see how the model did with its true predictions and its false predictions. You may be very good at saying when it wins, but you may be very bad at when you say uh, they're going to lose, right? So it, it depends. So what you have on the left side is what actually happened, right? So um, these were the losses, these were the wins, okay? And down here are what you predicted, okay? So this is the normalized. Let me show you without this. These are the trials, right? So this is this is it based on percentage, okay? And this is it based on the actual guesses and true record, okay? So what happened in this model? 25 times we predicted, right? So 25 times the yellow box, I'm gonna annotate here. <clears throat> you can see this. Okay, so 25 times we predicted you were going to win, okay? And of those 25 times that we predicted you were going to win, you in fact did win. This is the intersection of these two, right? This and this, all right? Um, and we also predicted two times that you would win, all right, but you in fact lost. You see that? So here's the wins that we actually said, and this is what in fact happened, right? So two out of 25 is pretty good, okay? And then over here for losses, we predicted that you would lose um, uh, zero times over here, right? Actually, we predict, let's start from the top here. So we predicted seven losses, okay? And that was correct, right? And we predicted, um, how many times did we, this is a better way to say it, how many times did we predict a loss that was actually a win was zero, okay? So we say loss and it is a loss. We were never wrong about losses. Everybody see that? Yeah? What you predicted, okay, you predicted a loss down here, and was it a loss? No. Uh, and you predicted seven uh, losses up here, and it was correct. So every time you predicted a loss, you were right. And the majority of the data, right, were wins, and you predicted a win 25 times, and you were right those 25 times, right? 
25 times out here, you were right. But twice when you predicted a win, you were wrong. You see that? Okay. So the predictive power of loss here, right, is better than the predictive power of winning. All right, you can look at total accuracy. Total accuracy is just the amount that you got correct over the total observation, right? So we got, let's look at this. So the, the way you sum that is the 25, uh, let's do that, right? So 25 correct wins plus the seven, right? Divided by total observations, which is going to be uh, 27, 32, 34. Right, so 32 over 34. Right, the blemish is this guy. Okay, so total accuracy is good, and you would say, okay, the model is, is good, but it is in fact much better at predicting losses, right, because losses is seven over seven. Right, there were seven losses and you predicted them correctly. And there were, uh, let's see here, right, there were 27, uh, wins, sorry, this is a little tricky over here, 27 wins, and you got 25 of them correct. I think it's a goofy thing over here. Let me try this again, 25, right? So the true negative rate is much better. Predictive power towards uh, the negative side is much better in this example. Okay, so that is what the confusion matrices look like, all right? And uh, let's keep going. So we do this several times. Uh, let me come out of our tape. We do this several times. We'll get different decision trees. You'll get different splits of the data, okay? And you'll get, um, and let's look at that. Actually, we had the normalized version up here, right? So 78 and 22, 100% accuracy down here. Um, and this is the split of how much there was, right? 78 and 22 sum to one here. Okay, so we continue to go through this. We do this for all the K-folds, and those are the individual models, right? And, all right, let's see what's keeping here. If you have questions, feel free to stop me. I want to say running it again. Okay, so here, my own prediction is not defined. Oh, I didn't run this. Oh, I've jumped a little bit. Okay, so we have this just ran. This needs to run now. All right, so there are the individual runs for this uh, decision tree based on the split. Okay. Now you have to make a decision. Okay. You've seen what the decision tree can do and how it differs. Um, from uh, how it can change based on where you sampled, right? This is a fundamental issue in statistics, right? Where did we, how did we sample and how did we verify that our samples are correct, right? How, and in machine learning, how did you sample the training data to train this model? And how did you choose the test data to make sure that what the model is predicting is in fact correct, right? So we try to lower the bias and uh, subjectivity in that by cross-validating. And you have a couple of approaches here, right? I always take the worst case approach, okay? And so, and this is why we built this data frame of the scores and the models, right? When I report what the model can do, and this is important as you go forward, right? You're gonna be able to build models, but it is incredibly important that you be upfront uh, with leadership because they're probably not data scientists and they're just going to look at it and say this is amazing, okay? But you have to explain to them uh, or the audience, right? It's important for us to explain to the audience who may not be data scientists that the accuracy of this can be as low as this. We have detected accuracies as low as 71%, right? Um, you could choose to take the average, right? Uh, if you have enough data, enough trials, um, you can take that. But I, just because of how I've seen data reported, always take the worst case. Uh, and the reason for that is 
in the in the wild, we tend to always um, uh, overestimate how accurate we are, and um, variables change. And so I always quote the lowest. So here it is. We have a model, uh, and when this goes out into the wild, um, sure we think it's a good model, but it can be as low as 71%, right? Um, and that is a semantic thing, right? Like we, it's a philosophical thing almost where you'd have to fight with leadership, but I always push for this. Okay, so, so now what you do is, they, you know, let's say you're having a conversation with leadership and they say, okay, this is great. I understand that it can be as bad as 71%. You may get it all right. And I would say, no, we, we wouldn't get it all right. The best that we've seen is 83%. Actually, no, we did have one that was 100%, right? So it's possible, right? But unlikely because there's other factors that we haven't thought of, right? This is a simplification of how to predict if the Celtics win. So um, we would say that this is the, the possibilities, but you take the lowest. And they say, okay, great. I understand what the ranges are. We'll give them an average score as well in a second. Um, of the models, and they say deploy it to production, right? We want you to use this model and predict if the Celtics are going to win or lose, or whatever your field is that you're using this for. We see it, we like it, deploy it for now, and let's run reports and publish analysis on it. Okay, now you have to make a decision as to what model you're going to use. Right. Will you use the worst performing model, right, uh, at 71%? Will you use the best performing model? You have access to all of them. Will you use a model that's closest to the average, right? And so this is a practitioner point. What we do at this point, okay, is uh, we've, we've cross-validated so we know we have, we have a good idea. We have a good estimation without that much bias of how bad and how good it can be, all right? We know it can go as bad as 71%. We know it can go as good as 100%. So that gives the ranges, right? I quote 71, great. Now what you can do is take all that data that we had, right? The, the, we broke the initial basketball data into training and test. If you take all that data now, right? And you build the model based on all of it, there's more, knowledge inside that model now, okay? And some of you may say, well, it might be overfitting, and that is exactly right. You may be overfitting if you use all the data within that model, right? But you now have to make a decision on how you will go out into the wild. Imagine it's a life and death situation. We're deploying a robot, okay? And the robot is gonna, you know, find the virus, okay? And it's gonna get rid of the virus wherever it sees it. And the robot has had, you know, one model of it scored 71%, the other model of it scored 100%. And if we feed it everything, it'll be really smart, but it, there may be some false positives, okay? And it's life and death now, let's say. Do you send the robot out with the model that isn't that smart, that only got it right 71%, or do you send it out with everything? And that's the call that's being made in practice now, right? We, we specify, look, the robot can be as bad as 71%, as good as 100%, but we're sending it out with all the data that we have now so that it has its best chance, even though we might overfit. Overfit means that um, it's generalizing uh, on results that it should not be, right? It's, it's, it's being too specific. But you've got to make a call at this point on how you want to go out. And so we send out the best model with all the data we have behind it, right? But we specify that it can be so bad or so good. Okay, and that is what happens here, right? Um, we create another decision tree, right? We fit it on all of X and all of Y, okay? There's no cut up here. Uh, and so here we go, we do this. And then you can see it's going to be perfect because it's learned everything. Right? We, and so what happened? We, we pushed it through with all the training data. Oh, no, wait a second, I have to execute here. I'm jumping around a bit. Okay, I'm gonna restart the kernel because I've jumped around a bit, let's see this. So 
We'll send it through all over again. Let's do that. Coming. You can see the stars are waiting. And you'll get back a confusion matrix that's perfect because it'll be. Yes, there we go. Right, okay, yeah. So here's the final model. Okay. All right, and this is based on without any cut up. Okay, so where are we? Here, right? We did not split here. We took all of X and Y, right? And we sent it through, and you get this final decision tree, okay, which is a little bit different. Like we have defensive rebounds in here now. Right, so it learned something by looking at all the data. And this is what goes out into the wild, right? And um, you can run this against the test set that you had, and you'll get uh, perfect scores for it because it's running on a model, it's running on data that it's learned everything about, right? And that is what goes out finally. So there's uh, this model again at the end. And if we had false positives, you could pull it. Okay, so that in a nutshell is how we go from data, which we had really no idea what the rules were, right? What do we need to do to win? And I can tell Moneyball, I'm sure a whole bunch of you have seen Moneyball. This is inspired from that example, right? What were the key factors that the team had to target to win, right? We've done the same thing here on a small set of data for the, the Boston Celtics. And we believe that you have to score above 98 points. You have to have um, more than 15 personal fouls. You have to have more than three blocks, right? That you can't have 2.5 blocks. This is an inherent limitation in visualization of the decision trees. So you have to have more than uh, uh, three blocks, more than 25 rebounds, more than 26 um, personal fouls, more than 27 personal fouls, uh, and you'll win, right? And depending on what happens with turnovers, if you have less than uh, 14 turnovers, you will win. Otherwise, all of the possibilities lead to a loss, right? Okay, so from this, we got the rules. We also, the thing to realize is the best predictor was how many points? The order of the tree matters. The most consistent predictor, uh, and what we saw from yesterday's lecture as well, was points. Uh, the higher you are up in the tree, the more consistent it is, right? So if you were to say, all right, let's just focus on one of these things, you would focus on points first, then personal fouls, then blocks, et cetera. Okay, it's a lot. Let's, uh, let's open it up for questions, yeah. Uh, I hope, yes, that is, I'm looking at the questions. Uh, let me read this one from Stephanie. Um, so the question is, how does this apply when the dependent variable has such a low base rate of occurrence? For example, team that has a low win rate. It shouldn't have a, such a low base rate of occurrence. The same analysis will come out, Stephanie. Um, what will happen is, is it will be that much harder for for wins to be pre predicted, but it doesn't, the split out shouldn't matter. The, the key thing is, um, are there discrete combinations for, and in the input set to say this is a, a win versus a loss? Because uh, that's really what the decision tree is doing, right? It's looking inside and saying, okay, when these things happen, this is the case. And when these things happen, this is the case. So, um, the, if there was a few amount of, uh, if there were few wins, as long as the combinations for the wins, this is a good question, as long as the combinations for those wins have unique um, uh, value, the decision tree will find it, right? Now, this is good. There are situations, this is, I really, I need to touch on this. There are situations where you won't get a decision tree, right? You can imagine, let's say you have, okay, look, let, let me draw, because this is, this is good. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing this. <clears throat> and I'm going to share my other screen. 
Okay. So you all should see um, a blackboard in a second. Hopefully it's coming up. Try it again. Good. All right. So everybody should see my screen here. Now imagine you had as <clears throat> let me move this out. Okay. So imagine we have uh, input. Yeah, okay, we'll say, yeah, let's say input. Input, output. All right, and that's fundamentally what's happening here, right? So let's say you have an input of three, okay? And the output is win, right? And you have an input of three, and the output is lost, okay? In this situation, there's no tree. It's not possible because if three implies, you know, win or loss. Okay. So the the state the state the danger occurs when you don't have consistency within the the data. Right here we would call this this is inconsistent. <laughs> Or um, we would say the it's highly impure, or the entropy is high, and that can happen when the data set is skewed one way. Now, how do you find that out? Run the decision tree, and if you get a decision tree, then you know that there is in fact consistency within the data. But if you don't be discouraged, this is actually a great question. If you were to come back and get this result, right? Um, and let's say you ran it on a whole lot of data. First thing I would say is, um, the first thing, sorry, let me um, see if I can adjust the echo here. The first thing I would say is, um, make sure you run it on enough data, see if you can get more uh, win records, loss records, right? So you get more combination because um, maybe this is the case, but as you add another variable, right, you can say that when this is five and this is six, Right? This would make this unique now, right? So the combination of five and three gives you a win, and the combination of six and three gives you a loss, right? And really what would happen is input would not be used. You would use the new variable. So I would say look at the data and see if you can get more, more of it and more columns in this specific case. Um, but even if you did that, okay, and um, you arrived at this result where there was no decision tree, rare but possible. I have seen it. Okay. What that means is that there's no consistency in recorded operations. And you should let leadership or the analysis that you're trying to produce know that. Right? This domain with this data does not have 100% action. Remember, decision trees are 100% all the time. This is the case. Right? Um, if they score more than less than 98 points, they are going to lose. 100% of the time, right? That is the prediction. And it may be that your organization or the data you're looking at does not have those types of uh, absolutes to it, right? So, and if that is the case, you should report. Okay, let me see, there was another question here. Let me go to the window, chat window. Okay. I'm just pulling up the chat window to see what else was asked. Okay, yeah. so then we have, right, let me pull this over so I can see it a little better. <clears throat> okay, so we have, all right, that's one. Then I'm looking at David's um, question. So respect to decision trees, I believe decision trees are biased with an, with an imbalanced data set. Okay, it would be recommended that we balance out the data set before creating the decision tree. After all, small vibration of variance in data can result in a different decision tree. That is true. You get some uh, breaks from that by cross-validating, right? Um, but if the data is inherently uh, skewed, um, you will end up with a situation where it's difficult for the tree to predict, okay? That's fair. And then let me see what else do we have here. All right, from uh, David, testing accuracy. Times completely ran the data without better decisions. Yes, that's right. Yep. Let's 
uh, max resolution. Uh, that's also a possibility, right? So there are some uh, there's some questions about what the final model should be, um, and it is true that um, we might overfit, and so you can take some steps towards the final model to not overfit uh, and set it out into the wild. It's a it's a practitioner call, um, but most of the time we send out the model with as much data as it possibly can get because we know that there's things that are missing. So we err on the side of overfitting. Um, but it's a call, right? You'd have to run simulations to see. Thanks. So, okay, let me see if there's any other questions. If there's any other questions, you can interrupt me. I'm just going through the chat window. Uh, I guess we can then determine if your Lakers will repeat. You know, I I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of mixed on LeBron. Um, it is it is likely that they will repeat. I don't know. You know, I I don't know. I I, I hard to say. I'll, I'll run the analysis and see what comes up. Um, most of the time, it's the team that spends the most money and has the least injuries. And those are the two uh, variables that I look at the most often. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, yeah. So what other questions do you have? <laughs> Individual edition webinar. My name is Albert, and I'm a data science instructor at Anaconda. In this Hi. session, I'm going to introduce the Anaconda distribution. I'll show you. Oh, someone is, yeah, sorry. I, I was all set to talk to David. <laughs> okay. Um, let me jump back out over here. I Any have questions? a couple more questions. Sure. And I asked one a little bit earlier, if you could reiterate the difference between um, a feature and a label. Yeah, uh, a feature is data science talk for an independent variable. That's all that is. Okay. And uh, a label is data science talk for the dependent variable. That's it. Okay. Feature is independent, label is dependent. That's right. Okay. All right. And then my final question I put in there is, so then the final model, the one that's accepted, is it presented as a regression equation? Is that what we're talking about? You can, uh, you can present the final model as a regression equation. Um, in decision trees, what we do is we present the, we present the decision tree itself along with the feature importance of each of the uh, variable, All right? So you can see the, I think we have it here actually. Um, you can see from the height uh, of the tree, which is the most important, but we can also print out um, the factor analysis uh, of each of these variables, right? So I think, uh, this is my notebook crack, of course. Let's see this. I'm gonna keep scrolling. So uh, we output it with, yeah, uh, let's it. There is a way to output it so you can see all the um, um, importances for each of the features. And so that's what's put out. And um, the other thing that's uh, given is the training data and the test data, right? So we, and that comes down to the cross-validation um, breakout, right? So, but you still have, so you have to submit cross-validation you have to submit the scores, you have to submit the tree, you have to submit the feature importances, and then the final body of data that you chose to, to train the model on before you send it out into the wild has to be published, right? Because people have to know if there was bias, did you miss anything, et cetera. So those are the, the key output variables. Great question, yeah. What else do you guys have? Everybody's being too nice. I'm, I'm going to start asking questions. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, kind of lost here. Uh, just got myself through to the course materials, get into the latter part of the lecture. Uh, Greg, was that a question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so let me leave you guys with uh, um, um, some thoughts about all of this, right? Uh, you've seen uh, a model get created, 
from some data. And um, I encourage you to try to bring your own data sets in to the model. It's pretty easy. You have a CSV file, it'll cut it up. The things that you'll have to change are the features, the independent variables you have, and the dependent variables you have. The rest of the notebook will just run for you. Okay? So try to bring in your own data sets. Um, you will run into a situation called one hot encoding. Um, the SK Learn uh, libraries want everything to be numeric. It doesn't understand categorical values, so you have to do something called one hot encoding. Um, that's something that I'll cover in depth in the classification methods uh, section. But you can also take a look at one hot encoding. Um, you can just Google SK, uh, decision tree and one hot encoding if you have categorical uh, data. It's pretty easy to deal with. Um, and it basically assigns a score for your categorical value, right? It makes it numeric so SKLearn can understand it. And um, it's a process. The more you do it like anything, the stronger you will get at it. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to report poor results. If your model is only scoring 60, 70, 50 percent, that's what it is, right? You have to be upfront with them and and let them know. You know, I had I had big questions about remdesivir, uh, and as the trials went on, the it became less and less uh, likely that remdesivir was a cure, right? So you have to be as uh, transparent about these things as possible. And you know, we just we need more data, and it could be that the phenomena is not understood. So um, if you ever have any questions, you can reach me. Uh, my goal is to get um, as many people We have two stuff people, as we have people mm -hmm. have, who have uh, questions. Uh, oh, Alina Thompson. Okay, yeah, yeah. Alina Thompson. And uh, David. Um, uh, David M. Uh, is it Chapton? If you can, if you can yeah, ask. Uh, so I looked at this is Alina yeah. Thompson. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Alina. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah. I'm calling with a uh, question concerning the, um, you downloaded or gave us apps to download um, Python and Jupyter. I had a question about Jupyter. Apparently it's the main app when it comes down to the decision trees and validation. If you don't have uh, the trees, can you still do the cross validation without a tree? in the event that you're in a situation where you have to give some type of validation for your outcome? You won't be able to cross-validate. Thanks for your question. So you won't be able to cross-validate um, without the tree because the tree is the model that you're checking the um, uh, predictions against, right? So. Okay. Yeah, so you do need it. And so if we go to the cross validation section, mm -hmm. where are we? Right here, right? So you need the cross val score. This is a shorthand for what we did all the way down here. Um, yes. That requires the model. Yeah, so you do need it. Um, now, for, for many of you, you will have the same problem I have in that you're coding on a network which is not connected directly to the internet. Right? So you may have a problem getting SK Learn. For those of you on the internet, congratulations. You know, that's a wonderful place to be with, with research, okay? If you cannot, um, if you are on a private network, the way to do it is to um, download the files independently uh, for the particular library. And Conda, Anaconda, right, um, does a better job of packaging up the files that you will need than PIP uh, at this point, right? Um, PIP is really built for running off the internet and it pulls the dependencies you need. Anaconda builds the same packages. So there's an SK Learn package for Anaconda, uh, but it packages up most of the dependencies you'll have. They've thought about the fact that you're on a private network. So you, you should be able to get the decision tree libraries from there if you need it. Does that answer your question? Yes, I'm new to this and everything. I'm, I'm familiar with SAS and MATLAB. Uh, Python's different. I just graduated from Biomedical Informatics and Rutgers, Dr. Shankar. Um, so, so far, it's very interesting. I'm liking it. 
I just want to make sure if I'm going to download Jupyter uh, and Python, I've already downloaded and started uh, kind of pretty much catching up with how to use it. Um, it looks easier to me than um, when I was dealing with staff, pretty much. But um, I'm enjoying it. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. And I could have given a more simple notebook, but I wanted, I knew the audience was like very educated as professionals and across the field, across the world here. So I wanted to give you something that was real so you could see, you know, the decision points and how we go from, you know, some data to a, to a working model. Um, and so if you're able to manage the complexity here, this is about as hard as it gets, right? The, the next step from here is what happens when we have a gigantic amount of data that we can't fit into memory, right? Or um, what happens when, uh, let's, say, let's say that uh, we don't care so much uh, about having a visual depiction of what's happening, right? So the decision, okay, real fast. There are two big classifiers, really three, that are used nowadays. Decision trees, random forests, which are really just aggregations of decision trees to prevent overfitting, right? You can achieve the same thing with cross-validation with decision trees, okay? Random forests do it for you under the hood, okay? Oh, if you could mute, sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> Nana, English. Not on super mute everybody if you can. Okay. I know. Yeah, the I other thinking. way to do it is um, neural networks. And the down, here's the thing. Um, with, the, with neural networks, you won't get a decision tree like this. And what this is, is we call this explainability, right? So um, decision trees are inherently explainable. Um, you can, they'll come back and say, how did you come up with this? And we'll say, well, we use such and such an algorithm, here's the training data, and here is exactly how the decisions are being made. Perfect, all right? This is how the model is predicting, okay? So if you get audited, you can say, this is what it is, all right? These are the factors we use, and these are, you know, the decision points. With neural networks, you don't get that. Neural networks, there's a lot of work going on to make them explainable, but the reality is, is you just did it a whole bunch of times, and it's coming up with the right answers now, all right? So you have to make the decision at that point as to which way you will go. They tend to be more accurate, right? But if you need to be explainable, you and, and it's a must, if you need to be explainable, you've got to stay with decision trees or random parts. They are the same. So, okay, uh, does anybody else have questions? I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, David. You're welcome. Yeah. David, have Yes, I did have a quick question um, regarding decision, sure. decision trees. So uh, much like um, the girl before me, uh, Biomed, uh, that's where I'm at um, field-wise. Two main entities we learned, you know, the tree have decision nodes where the data is being split up. We get outcomes. My question is with respect to the binary tree for prediction, you know, when we're predicting whether a person is fit or unfit, Will this really be dra dramatic and drastic if we have all types of age groups and eating habits, if we're looking at, for example, or like exercise habits? Will the, will the data be- Fantastic question. Yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure like, that it doesn't get skewed in any, any different direction. Okay, so the decision tree, two things here, right? The decision mm -hmm. tree will only skew if the data underlying in training uh, mm -hmm. is that way, okay? It, it's just a, it's a matter of fact that this is what the breakouts are, right? Um, so if you feed it biased or skewed data, it will produce a model that is biased or skewed, right? So they still need us for that, and right? they still need the humans to look at it and say, hey, does this make sense? Um, the good news is that you can look at the output of the decision tree, and it's telling you, hey, I'm basing it based on such and such factors, and you can say, hey, you should not be. Right? That gives you an indication that it's skewed. Um, another way to look at it is if you're always getting a certain branch, if you're always getting, say, fit, right? you'll say, how can that be right? when the population is actually not fit? Right? So you can compare and say, hey, the, the data, is, the, the model is producing results that are contrary to what we see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is 
uh, as you folks go out and let's say you start putting in, this is great. Uh, let's say you, you, you say, you know what, I'm going to try this with my own data. All right. And you go out and you get a model that has, I don't know, 200 columns and 20,000 rows. Okay. Each of those rows have values that can map into these, these decision nodes, right? We have points less than 101. There'll be points less than 101 point, 103, whatever, right? We can keep going. Depends on how many combinations there are. Beyond human calculations, how many calculations they are. If you do that, you may come back with a decision tree that is unwieldy, right? It is explainable, but it can't be read right. because there's too much depth and there's too many nodes, right? So this is wonderful, okay? So if you, and what that looks like, uh, uh, the gentleman who knows Edmund, Edmund's uh, last decision tree when he uh, uh, took data science at UMD, he had, it, it looked like a heat map. It, it looked like shades of the sun because there were, you just imagine this, there were just boxes everywhere of different colors, right? So the decision tree was logical and you could train, you know, go back and say, how, did, how was the decision made? But you had to be almost a computer to do so because there were so many branches. So then you come to this point where you say, okay, we have a decision tree and the decision tree is maybe running at 85% accuracy. And it's explainable, but nobody can figure out what the output is uh, because there's too many branches and the tree is too big, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then you have a neural network, which is not explainable, but is beating it by maybe 10 to 15% accuracy, mm -hmm. right? And so at that moment, you know, you can say, hey, do we really want to stay with something that's less accurate? Even though it's explainable, it's unintelligible, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, that is another reason why the field has moved to neural networks for this type of stuff, especially when the, particularly when the intelligibility of the tree is beyond human comprehension. Another computer may see it and say, perfect sense. But you and I are going to say, what is that? All right? So, um, yeah. Great question. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Who else? May I ask another I think, question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Keep going. I, I, we, we can just continue to go. I'm happy to answer questions indefinitely. Yeah. Okay. So I, I didn't introduce myself earlier because I was late on, but um, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm a clinical psychologist. And um, I direct a clinic, but I'm moving now into policy and procedure and looking at our data and how we're applying it. And our biggest issues are issues of like predicting suicidality, for example with you know, huh. years and years of data from our electronic health record. Um, but I was trained in a day, this is my first academic class in decades. Um, and when I was trained, we were trained not to go fishing for independent variables, right? That we had huh. to have like a really tight and focused hypothesis um, mm -hmm. and not go fishing. But, but what this is upsetting in me, I think, is that using machine learning is actually potentially going fishing, right? Like I could just dump all my variables in. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 hello, Prem. Uh, before you respond to that question, let me make a final uh, statement <laughs> for those who have time uh, conflict and then want to leave. Again, thank you so yeah. much for... Uh, the two days of excellent uh, presentation. Of course, today was, I'm sure, a little technical or mechanical for some of you, but that is just the nature of data science. So you get used to it, those who are novices uh, in this. So next week, uh, before that, uh, we posted uh, an evaluation in, in the chat room here, and then also, I believe, in, uh, in Slack. It takes a few uh, minutes, maybe one or two minutes to complete you. So we encourage all of you to complete that for us so that we get some feedback for the next module and then uh, others. So the next module will be next week, same time, Thursday and then Friday, and that will be data exploration and visualization. Then we'll take it uh, from there. So again, thank you all for your interest in this and then thank you for coming. All right, uh, Dr. Saga says he can be here for a few more minutes. So if you have time, yeah. if you okay. want to ask questions, he is here to uh, respond to that. Again, thank you so much.
Thank All you, right. everybody. So Sam, much. Thank you so you. much, John. Thank you. Um, so, and if you have any follow on questions, you can reach me at prem.edu, prem.edu. I put it in the uh, uh, chat box and I'll put it also on Slack. So, um, and if you can mute, that's great. So, um, let me talk about what you, you just said, going fishing, right? So, if you go, we didn't get a chance to see it, but if you uh -huh. let me share my screen here too, I'm going to unshare. Um, um. So if you go back to the um, PDF uh, lecture we had, I'm just going to pull that up. <clears throat> All right. The way that you can figure out what to target once this comes up. <laughs> okay. All right. So if you go back here. Mm -hmm. right. Um. Sorry, yeah, this is what we want. Okay, and then if you scroll down to you get to the section on association rules, right? This is where the fishing happens automatically. All right, so Stephanie, you have some data, okay? And you're trying to analyze it and you don't want to say, you know, here's the output variables because there could be many, right? And it could be that there's two or three things that are being affected, right? So how do you find out what to go after? Right, and the answer to that is association rule. So what you can do is, if you look over here, um, we have, this is a transaction, right? It's very similar to the target example. And so um, each time someone went into a store, let's say the first time they bought beer, orange juice, and diapers. Next time they bought beer, Q-tips and diapers, beers and chips, and then beer and Advil. All right, you're welcome, David, see ya. So from this, okay, we can derive that beer implies, buying beer implies buying diaper 50% of the time, right? And diapers implies beer 100% of the time, right? So this is a small sample of the relationship that you'll find within your data, okay? Now, this one is simple because we have a single input and a simple, a single independent variable and a single dependent variable being point pointed, right? But the reality is association rules um, have, like this is a more complicated example, there's actually a, and what this is is an example that we did for um, a contract, right? So if a contract is above a certain amount of money, right, and the delivery either has set delivery times or doesn't have set uh, delivery time, right? So it's either not set or it's biweekly, let's say, okay? And it has QA deliverables or it does not, and it has acceptance uh, oh, and yeah, so acceptance, this is the transaction. They got great customer acceptance, they got average customer acceptance, right? So we've not pinpointed what the dependent variable here is, we're just looking at data, right? When you run this, you'll get 190 some odd rules that come out of it, right? And they'll have varying confidences, right? What you saw before with the beer example is, beer implies diaper 50% of the time, okay? But diapers imply beer 100% of the time. So you'll, and that's what the confidence is being, Stephanie. So what will happen is, is you'll run association rules on your data and a whole bunch of combinations of input variables and output variables will be identified with their associated confidences. And then you can look at that and say, I didn't know that this happened X percentage of the time, right? And it will tell you what the possible combinations are for your output variables, right, with given confidences. So you don't have to fish. And fishing on big data is drowning, right? It's not possible, right? So um, when I cover classification methods, I'll talk about association rules and um, what happens at a, at, a very, at a very, very high level is when you step into data analysis, um, the first thing we do is we get distribution. We want statistics on your data. All right, let's look at the distribution. Then, then maybe we look at, but, but then we have to start talking about, well, what is it that you want? And you may not know what you want, All right? So we'll tell you what's actually happening, right? And we'll tell it to you the first way through association rules, because we don't know what you want, All right? But association rules will tell you what's actually happening with varying confidences with that. The girl from Target, an 85% chance that she's pregnant, right? They found that. They weren't targeting it, it just happened to be the case, right? So we then present all that to you, 
And then you say, okay, I, we knew we wanted these kinds of outputs. We care about these you know, dependent variables, but we also care about these other ones that you may have spotted. And then the classification models get built based on what you thought was important from the automatic fishing that happened in association rules. It's an excellent question. Excellent question. That is how the, the genesis of all of this comes together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Stephanie, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else have questions? Okay, as you go forward, um, there's also a resources page, right? So that will take you to where all these libraries are, the links to how to get installed. Um, you can reach me uh, again anytime at uh, prem, dot, uh, prem at umd.edu. Again, my goal is to just get everybody to understand this stuff the best we can. We cannot do the analysis for everybody, and people need to become more analytical and understand what's possible here. So. If there's no other questions, uh, I thank you all for your time. I wish you all the best, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Uh, no, note also that uh, Professor Saga will come back at uh, another module, I think, in module five or six. So you look up to that also. Yeah. All That's right. So in, we'll in see all of you yeah. next week in your numbers. Thank you. Thank All right. you. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody. You. Yeah, thank everybody. you. Bye. Thanks a lot. I learned a lot, uh, Fred. Good material. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>